Oh my god. Oh my god. So when when did you read um, um Bluebeard last? When when was that re- uh, a couple of days ago or did when did you finish? Um I finished it uh maybe like a few days ago. So uh I mean like we might as well just like start uh here then, right? Um so Yeah, 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 sure. Artifact number 24. Uh, I'm joined by Ethan Pinch who's a UK painter. We're going to discuss the Kurt Vonnegut novel Bluebeard. I have the first mm-hmm. edition which was uh, from 1987. Uh, as you can see, um, Ethan has showed up with a fresh haircut, uh, looking uh, the best that I've ever seen him uh, personally. Um, so thank you, Ethan, for uh, doing that specifically for this show. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, he actually came up with the idea of, you know, let's discuss Bluebeard. We had a, a bunch of shows before uh, and we were thinking, you know, what to do next. And I first read this book maybe um, maybe a year ago. Uh, and uh you know, it's not that I wasn't necessarily impressed by it. Like, I don't consider it uh, part of like his his greatest work, right? Like Slaughterhouse Five, um, you know, Breakfast of Champions, uh, Cat's Cradle. I, I think that's his best work. But upon this rereading that I did recently, I just finished it about a week ago. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that could be discussed, right? Just both from a writerly perspective, right? There are paragraphs that are memorable. There are structural decisions that are memorable. There's the fact that, you know, it's a book that covers the idea of, of art itself, right? Specifically visual art, but of course you could branch out to other categories as well. And he often like reiterates some of the points that he's making uh, about visual art within the work itself. Uh, this isn't necessarily always done uh, effectively, right? Like I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that I consider uh, problems in the text, but you know, it's interesting enough, right? This is, um, you know, this is Kurt Vonnegut. It's, it's he's he's almost always uh, uh, worth a read and worth a discussion. But since Ethan is a painter, and since he is uh, far less skeptical of abstract expressionism than I am, I thought it would be a good idea to have this uh, conversation um together uh maybe uh, ethan you could uh, talk about the book a little bit what basically what, what made you want to uh, discuss this book well um yeah thanks alex for um having me on uh bluebeard by vonnegut well you know there's a whole new generation of readers that are you know becoming familiar with vonnegut now and you know um bluebeard is has always been one of the the sort of lesser known or you know it's it's you know it's not doesn't get the same kind of critical attention as cat's cradle or breakfast of champions or um mother night or certainly not um sort house five and certainly it's not his best novel you know it's it's not even his second best novel but i do think it's it is a, an underrated novel and an underappreciated novel. Certainly, I mean, it is a novel about a painter, and um, you know, my bias is that I'm a painter, certainly. But just as uh, compared to other novels about painting, you know, I think you know this is this is really good. I mean, I mean, usually, I don't think novelists are, are actually very good often at getting the tone of art right or fine art in novels right. I mean, I mean. Uh, you only have to think of the unhelpful kind of sentimentalism you get from people like John Updike or, um, you know, Colm Tolbin or you know, this kind of like um, art commentary, which is, you know, middle class audiences swallow it up. And um, it's kind of those writers sort of treat art as like a holiday from the real world, from their work. That's not the case with Bluebeard. It's a sophisticated um, book. It's it's really it's, it really has a, a lot to say about art and about painting and like um, uh, and in a way that's useful in sort of a literary way and i think it, it's sort of interesting to sort of see where this sort of book sort of stands in his um corpus you know his, his bibliography you know um there are all sorts of themes and ideas that come around again and again in sort of vonnegut's work and characters and no 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 um more so than in bluebeard which almost feels like shall we say a culmination or a kind of or an attempt of bon- Vonnegut to try and resolve some of the ideas that he introduces in other novels. Um, and, you know, 
it's been said that this is a kind of semi-autobiography. There are certainly um, parts of Rabo Karabiki and the main character's life that that have parallels to Vonnegut's life, kind of his own, uh, what we could assume are sort of, you know, they, they, seem, they seem like Vonnegut's perspective, although, we, again, we can't completely trust that it is. But, you know, I think it, it is, it's, it's a fascinating book. I think um, to get a book like this about kind of the art world and about, you know, painting, like, it, a closest connection is like Nervre by, by uh, Zola or something like that. You know, really, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of other books I can really point to. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, and, and yeah, I, I don't think that this book is like, let's say, um, Vonnegut putting modernist painting on trial, you know, like a, like a sort of, you know, um, like a big court drama or something like, like weighing up, as I was saying to you, kind of in our exchange, just like weighing up the sort of, the, the merits of one kind of art against another. I think, you know, this is kind of, you do get kind of these big existentialist questions that you get in Vonnegut and you know why are we here where are we going what's it all for and you know I, I think kind of that's connected in a way to kind of the, um, you know shall, shall we say kind of um the same the same kind of quandaries that the modern artist is in you know sort of one sort of um sort of different modes of belief or different ways of living grating up against one another these you know kind of um paradoxes contradictions these play out in Vonnegut a lot I mean I could go on and like I you know that's one of the reasons why I could have mm -hmm. asked to talk about this book because there's a lot to go on but you know like like you say there's a lot to talk about and um uh, it's it's you know it's I think it's a very rewarding liter literature in that way you know not just because we can sit down and you know analyze it it's just a really good book you know the characters are really vivid it's it's a quite engaging story and a quite emotional story from Vonnegut in a way kind of um you know we can talk again about kind of um we can talk later about you know what kind of um you know the values or kind of the themes might be but like you know it's it does have this um, um it does have this kind of force to it it's not like just uh you know it has some sentimental elements there he doesn't allow sentimentalism to come in in a way in this novel that he doesn't in others but it's an under underappreciated work of, of literature. I actually think it's um, better than um, Cat's Cradle. Not as good as um, Breakfast of Champions, and certainly not as good as Sort House Five, which is a work of you know um, Swiss mechanical precision. You know, from beginning to end, you feel like Vonnegut is con in complete control of that novel. Whereas even in Breakfast of Champions, you feel like he's a bit more loose. I mean, so that has some of the highest points of his writing, but it's it's more kind of um, he's more kind of loose in the way it's put together. I think. Um, Bluebeard is somewhere in between the two you know it's uh, it's actually it has a um, as a for, uh, like formally as a story it's actually um, uh, really coherent and really kind of strong but it, it, it doesn't sort of it's not sort of as daring or sort of as high minded maybe as sort of Sword House 5 but um, yeah <laughs> yeah um, you know, to, to your point about uh, how writers uh, typically approach the visual arts I mean I, I think there is a, a merit there you know largely because I mean if you, like if you think about it um, you know we all kind of come into the world with various uh, biases various like strengths and weaknesses if you are mm -hmm. a writer for example as I am um, <clears throat> you're gonna approach things perhaps like sort of like narrative first right and to the extent that you know for example my writing you know there's going to be imagery and stuff like that uh it there's still this kind of sense of okay so like you know recently i i i've been working on a novel and uh if if i'm working on a piece of description you know just kind of like visual cues um i always think you know how much is too much how much is too little right i i never want to sort of go uh, overboard right in, in that way and a lot of that has to do with like specifically well how, how does this serve the larger narrative you know unlike with a with a painting the narrative that that comes about in a book is you're usually going to get uh, even if it's not a complicated plot you're going to get a plot right a, a bunch of things will happen and you're going to have to connect the dots in some way over the course of one two you know perhaps 300 more pages so uh approaching like visuals in that sense you're going to always have to think to what extent does the following image or this following set of images if it's like a paragraph or longer how do they cohere with the rest of the narrative how do they mm -hmm. add to this chapter uh if it's going on too long is it some sort of subtraction so 
you know, earlier in our conversation, the, the first uh, conversation that we had uh, back in 2020, when we were discussing mm-hmm. visual art, like one of your cr- critiques was, you know, Alex, you approach things too much from a kind of, you know, uh, almost a purely narrative perspective. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, this is one of the reasons why, like when I when I uh, uh, look at art, right, I, I do try to consciously not do that. Right. I try to like think about how else can I discuss, you know, th- these kinds of features. So we always have our uh, various biases, you know, uh, approaching these things um, and specifically about how writers talk about painting within writing. Uh, you know, it's hard to like think of, uh, I'm sure I've read novels uh, besides this one that that, that touch on uh, these themes, but uh, more often it's like poetry, right? right? Like a lot of poetry mm-hmm. wants to discuss painting, right? Like, you know, you, you have like tons of uh, poetry that, uh, uh, purports to kind of like explain a painting, right? Or to add to it mm-hmm. somehow. And you, you, yeah, you see the kinds a, of mistakes very, that are made very, there, you know? It's, it's been going on for all the time, though, in, in, a, in a weird way, even going back to the ancient Greeks, there's kind of been this weird sort of incestuous thing where sort of um, poets and playwrights kind of imagine themselves as painters. And even, even painters kind of quite like to sort of fantasize about being storytellers sometimes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, like it can be, it can be interesting, you know, like um, uh, for one medium to, you know, like it, like it phrases us in a way for one medium to kind of um, uh, try and ape or even kind of um, sort of bring in the conventions of another medium, mm-hmm. you know, the way that one, uh, you know, one medium can, um, uh, sort of open up the space of possibility in another, for instance. I mean, I'm, uh, and that usually um, doesn't happen, right? Was the point I was making that it usually? It, no, it doesn't usually happen. It certainly it doesn't, and 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 that's kind of the that that's it, it does become a problem sometimes when you, you try and make the art one kind of medium to serve into the rules of another. But I think that's really just it's just um uh, it, it's just a thing about you know. Um, generally, generally ignorance and, and not kind of like in a sort of judgmental way, just like sometimes, you know, there are people who want to know about art and are curious to know about art, but they just don't know as much about something than another. And so it's kind of, you know, theory comes in to fill the gap. And most, and, you know, if you're a literary guy, then it's literary theory. You know, like there, there's all sorts of, you know, there's all sorts of paintings that we see in modernism, especially that we feel kind of conflicted about. As you know, we, we don't really know whether to accept all of it and not and kind of like, you know, and sometimes we just want to pick a side. Mm-hmm. You know, we just, you know, um, uh, and, you know, I feel like this ultimately is kind of, this is a kind of trap that kind of, well, like we kind of fall into with kind of like a lot of the the modern art talk that happens. A lot of the most Philistine critics who, who sometimes rake in incredible sums like Stalin Brass, you know, like, I'm a, it, like I'm a, it's all about basically, you know, how can I use this art to talk about neoliberalism you know or something mm, like that yeah you know, it's it's it, it's it's just in in a way um, um it, it, it's just in a way to let to give the audience like a nice reassuring thing or which side do i come down on um it's it's just a way for critics to use art as a uh some some excuse for an exciting description of some new societal formation or, mm-hmm. or you know or you know, something else but i think i think vonnegut is very sophisticated about kind of the way he talks about painting you know um you know if, if you didn't know anything about this book you might think well um this is vonnegut he's going to be lampooning abex and, and all this sort of stuff but no he is quite sympathetic to it and in a way he almost kind of imagines what would it be like to be one of these abex guys what you know imagine um but it's again it's not like a, a it, it's a conflicted sort of thing he he sort of allows us to sort he sort of allows us to buy into the romantic myth of the of the abex painter but he also introduces things that disturb that romanticism and i mean this i mean yeah uh i, I would be, i've been talking for a number of days with different people about vonnegut and something to in a way kind of prepare and get the, the juices going Von, vonnegut is a kind of interesting figure because he's a figure he's kind of caught between two worlds you know he starts off as a sci-fi writer gradually turns into a kind of postmodern figure you know, deconstruct. Like I wrote, you know, the guy, a guy who wrote writes anti-war novels, which travesty the idea of anti-war novels. You know, so uh, and if you think about the Abex artists, you know, America was is like founded by Puritans, really. You know, I mean, we like to think it's you know the first post-enlightenment nation, but really it was all the Puritans who sort of like were kicked out of other countries. Um, and sort of you know, right up until kind of like World War II, the tastes of America were largely 
quite you know, puritanical, quite, you know, it was regional art, you know, sort of like um, uh, that kind of stuff. And like almost overnight, America becomes the center of modern art, you know? And suddenly these people who were like, you know, quite marginal figures, you know, these modern abstract painters are kind of like um, chic. And, you know, there, there's the, it, and, and none of them quite know how to adapt to it. I mean, some do. De Kooning does quite easily, but not all of them. And not all of them are able to really sustain it properly um, or, 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 you know, like Jackson Pollock. And so there's this kind of element of kind of um, crisis and, 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 and what have you. What, and what, think, what do you mean by you know, su sustaining it? What, is, what does that look like? What is that exactly? Well, or sustain, well um, just that Jackson Pollock has a relatively short career, you know? I mean, uh, he, um, uh, he makes a transition to kind of, you know, the kind of the abstract the Jackson Pollock stuff we know today with kind of mm -hmm. the splats and the dribbles. He keeps that up for a while, kind of, um, it kind of, he kind of runs out of steam with it. He kind of turns it, he kind of turns it into a kind of mannerist style for a little while. I mean, uh, this, this is my opinion, but it's, I'm not alone in thinking this. Um, and then kind of makes a sort of return to figuration and then kind of, he dies. Uh, it, and, but there, there are, there are a lot of kind of, um, Abexters, who I mean, there, there's who die young as well. Um, Franz Klein dies young. Um, Pollock, um, um, you know, alcoholism. Rosco kills himself. Uh, so there's a sense that all these guys, that there's kind of something in the culture that you know, um, with the substance abuse and kind of like um, untreated depression, um, social alienation. Uh, and, and also kind of the fact that kind of they get caught in a certain kind of iconic style and then in a way kind of they've done everything they wanted to do. They've said everything they wanted to say. They've done it. Where do they go? And, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, and you know, I think in a way like is there's a what comes across to me before I read this book, you know, there was the point in my life where I was actually quite hostile towards the abstract expressionists. Um, uh, and it was actually, you know, uh, I actually discovered like, you know, uh, Dan Schneider, uh, like uh, online and I, I read his essays and he didn't do anything to kind of um, convince me otherwise. I thought, yeah, it, those fucking abstract expressionists, it's easy if it's about nothing. And, uh, you know, a lot of the abstract art I saw in my school was kind of like, you know, pretty limp. So, you know, that didn't change my mind. But there was always something there, you know, like in the back of my mind, I always knew there was something there was something kind of attractive about the abstract expressionists, but it always felt kind of like, I didn't like what it, I felt it represented. And, you know, then I read this book and kind of, it was, it was kind of refreshing to me, the sympathy that Vonnegut felt for these guys or, or the sympathy that seemed to come across the feeling of solidarity. He seemed to feel with these people. Cause remember that, you know, a lot of these abstract expressionist guys, they were, if not second generation, first generation sort of immigrants, you know, um, they were kind of, um, and like I said, they kind of, uh, they kind of ha have these sort of strange, staggered careers where kind of you know they might start in one place and end up somewhere else, and you know that it's, um, and also this this whole sort of the existentialism, right? Um, because, like I was saying in our correspondence online, you know, with post-war art, sort of existentialism was kind of the intellectual fashion, right? And sort of, you know, existentialism is kind of there. It's sort of inextricably bound up in the whole legacy, you know, the mythology now of the abstract expressionists, you know, that there's all this kind of turbulent emotion beneath the surface of their paintings, but also the fact that kind of certain abstract expressionists, not all of them, but some of them would um, name drop, you know, uh, uh, existentialist philosophers and sort of drape themselves in sort of existentialism. Um, and Vonnegut, in a way, is is himself an existentialist, maybe a postmodern existentialist, but that's there too. You know, why are we here? You know, how can such horrible things happen? You know, blah blah blah. Um, but kind of that's sort of the connection there, and it's so so. It's interesting. Um, it's interesting, to, like, to see kind of what he sees in abstract expressionism, which is something worthwhile, but also something that sort of is is sort of conflicted you know he even he doesn't really know how to feel about it but then one can imagine you know what did the abstract expressionists even think about it completely because you know these things shift and um, um change over time and it's it's um, um i don't know i just think it's like as a kind of like a, a fictional 
you know, portrait of kind of all that sort of stuff. It's actually really interesting and really engaging because there's no like definitive singular kind of um, historical narrative or biography that can really tell the story of kind of like all this sort of stuff. It's all textual reconstruction. But I think this is actually a really good, you know, like the whole the whole story of Rabbi Karabekian sort of in a way being the story of modern modern art, you know, starting in, you know, Europe, displaced, ending up in America, which sort of is slowly this one world, which is changing into another, you know, this this explosion as this um, sort of industrial center, the, this cultural center, this financial center, this new superpower, sort of the unease, the feeling there. And then, you know, of course, sort of survivor's guilt. And what, I mean, I've heard people talk about this novel as, um, you know, Rabbi Karabekian. He's somebody who's, he's, you know, he feels pretty hard done by and pretty guilty. And he's almost searching for a way to be at peace. You know, that's, that's, that's the kind of hallmark Oprah club way of describing kind of what, what, what happens in this story. Rabo Karabekin tries to find peace, but in a way kind of, it, that is, that is kind of ostensibly what happens. You know, he has to try and find a way to, you know, uh, put things in perspective. And I've been talking for a while now. So, so, I yeah, probably so, 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 so just, just to touch on a few things that you said, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, what is either aesthetically, so like, you know, just uh, f for those that haven't seen previous shows, when I say aesthetics or aesthetically, um, I, I, I do differentiate that from uh, kind of like art itself, right? Where to me, aesthetics is, it's, it's a style, it's the kind of like, you know, a preferential treatment that an artist might give to, you know, a method of communicating um, as opposed to really the communication itself. Uh, like, so when I was a, a, a teenager and I was first kind of like thinking about the arts, um, I was actually probably more attracted to ABEX uh, uh, then, right? And I, I only uh, later sort of discarded mm. that, um, you know, kind of as, as, as I grew older. And, you mm. know, I think one of the reasons why it could be so attractive is, uh, you know, you're used to sort of seeing things a certain way or thinking about things a certain way. And somebody comes along and says, well, look, you know, here's a, here, here's a new set of puzzles a new set of riddles for you to, you know, uh, you know, kind of like find your way out of. And, you know, to me, that's, that's interesting, right? Like when I, uh, when I'm, you know, reading, a, a different kinds of like, a, a art mm -hmm. criticism or literary criticism, and then you see, you know, some of the stuff that Gertrude Stein might write, you th you think, you know, especially like, you know, when you're much younger, you think like, is there something to it? And if there is, um, how can I give it a fair shake? If there isn't, how can I, you know, uh, dismiss it without being needlessly right and unfairly dismissive? Mm -hmm. So I think there's definitely uh, that that element to it. At least this is the reason why uh, I was yeah. uh, attracted to it. Um, uh, w uh, w in in reference to Dan Schneider, so uh, Dan Schneider of Cosmotica.com, um, he he has uh, negative views of of abstract expressionism. And uh, the way that you characterize, it, I'm not sure if you necessarily characterize it in the same way that, oh, you know, all this stuff is about nothing. I'm, I'm actually very careful myself when I discuss uh, the arts to never say something like. Well, 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 Dan doesn't even say that it's it's about nothing. But, I, you know, I don't want I don't want to get caught up in kind of like, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't want to be like the, you know, the defender of Abex here. Like I'm a, like, no, no, I know. I, 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 I understand. I'm perfectly yeah, yeah, happy. Yeah. I'm perfectly happy and I'm perfectly willing and capable to, to launch defense of kind of abstract art. But like, in a way it makes no difference, you know, kind of, I feel like it's, it's, um, you know, abstract art, you know, it, it's kind of, you, you might dismiss it as a fad or whatever, but it's just like, you're a bit late. You know, I mean, like, uh, like it's, 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 it's like, it's perfectly, it's been perfectly naturalized now. It's not, it's not weird. I, you know, I can go down to the pub and find you three abstract painters, you know, yeah. and I don't live in London. I live in Huddersfield, you know, it, it's just, it's just a normal part. Like, you know, so it, it just, it's just utter philistinism to kind of say, oh, it's about money or it's like people being a trend. Like, no, um, like, but, but. I mean, obviously there are, there are things that we on a deep level kind of like, we almost can't help but kind of object to like when we like you know m like certain parts of the market or what have you but like the work is to like figure out kind of what we object to first you know it's like i think you know especially when you do learn about you know the abstract expressionists and kind of like 
individually what they were up against i mean like for, i mean i've heard people say kind of like you know used well used to hear a lot more people say that abex was a cia plot it's utterly ridiculous conspiracy theory um just like it's like a hair away from being like something Alex do, 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 do people seriously say that i mean like so, so, people so, so, seriously so, say but, but so, I mean, so, not anymore so, people genuinely used to say that it was i mean for i mean when when yeah honestly, i mean they, like they, they say 19- they say that about all kinds of stuff you know even today like that, that's like in, a, a common yeah, thing it's, right it, it's funny it's funny because like i mean back in 1949 you had um a, a congressman i have a note here congressman george a dondero in the house of representatives you know he said that um I've got a quote here, suprematism, cubism, expressionism, surrealism, Dadaism, futurism, constructivism, all these isms are of foreign origin and truly should have no place in American art. Add to this group of subversives the following satellites and the number swells to a rabble. Motherwell, Pollock, Baziotes, David Hare, the, um, they are the link between the communist art of isms and the so-called modern art of America. So there were people who believed that Avex was a communist plot, you know, like rather than. Yeah, you know, but, but I mean, like the, the, so, these cult, these culture war games that are, are played, you know, all the time about pretty much, yeah, you know, any anything. Right. It, um, yeah, it's 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 but that's this. This is the, the joke to me. You know, like you have people saying it's a CIA plot. It's a communist plot. Um, like, um, uh, you know, it, but that's that's just it it's, it's just it's not you know it's not it's not a real criticism yeah I, I, yeah I I, I I i you know I, I don't think we should even you know dwell on like these like very fr- like uh, like to the extent like i don't oh, even no, call it, 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 it's, it, it's it not even fringe helpful. right it's it's it's, it in, it's helpful, in the sense of like but, it just being you know like just people play these cultural games all the time but to, to me it's, it's more interesting like to go back to this idea of like nothingness like the i think the more hmm. common critique right which is why I, the I, common I'm, critique that it's about nothing yeah that, 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 that point, it's about right? nothing like it's like well like we were talking okay okay just 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 like, like, like allow me okay. to like make a point just for a second okay Sorry. so like so like about you know the idea that it's about nothing uh you know people play like cultural like you know war games all the time but i think the more generic critique that we hear over and over again is well abax you know it's about nothing it's about nothing it's about nothing i don't find that kind of critique persuasive either because um what i was alluding to earlier is i'm very careful about uh, uh like uh, like not saying that uh, a work of art that I happen to think is bad is necessarily like not art. That's a very common thing that people say, right? What they mean to say is, oh, this is a work of art that I think is bad. But instead of saying that, they quickly want to, you know, call it, you know, like they want to say like, oh, it's not art or it's about nothing. I think dance critique is more so in line of, uh, instead of like viewing it as, oh, this is something about nothing, why don't we just say that it's about the thing that is being represented? I mean, when I was looking um, in preparation yeah. for this, like, so, so like uh, in, in uh, Vonnegut's uh, novel, he, he mentions um, the artist and also you brought up uh, this artist, uh, Ad uh, Reinhardt, right? So he had, Reinhardt. You know, yeah. yeah, he, he had, yeah, he had, he had cartoons, uh, uh, you know, explaining mm. sort of the origins of modern art. And They're he was, fantastic. A, and he, and he was a, 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 he was an abstract expressionist painter to some degree. Mm. Like, I think, uh, you, you know, I don't want to pick he, he was too he much. Kind of, well, he, he kind of kind of a bit of a, a minimalist, but he was a little yeah. bit before yeah, yeah. that was a yeah. uh, he was kind of a minimalist in abstract expression that, that to be pedantic. Yeah. yeah. So so like to, you know, when I was uh going over some of the things that he explicitly said about his own art or about, you know, maybe some other Abex painters, you know, he would say things like uh, I want my art, like when, when you get to like the 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 50s and 60s when he starts doing those so-called black paintings, right? Um, oh, yeah. He, he says, I want these paintings to be completely free of narrative, right? I want them to be narrative free. I don't want them to be a reference to anything, you know, other than like reflexively kind of like what it is. Uh, I'm not sure how anyone could like j- just how it's illogical to say that a bad piece of art is in fact not art because you know it is art it just happens to be something that you think is bad uh i don't think you could actually say that any work of art is narrative free i mean uh, a a a a canvas that is just black right not not that his you know canvases were all black right they were like shades right and different variations and stuff like that but that also is a narrative. Now, you might say that's not a narrative with any depth. You might say that's not a narrative that I personally like or, you know, whatever, aesthetically, whatever you want to say. But that is also a narrative, 
right? And I think mm-hmm. this kind of knee, just... knee jerk reaction to sort of escape the idea that this is narrative that it, that in itself is some strikes me as a little bit of, as a way to try to justify either to yourself or to an artist that you know this is how we could uh, uh, avoid maybe some of these other kinds of critiques, right? Mm-hmm. I, well, yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely see where you're coming from. But you know, narrative is just a word, and you know, in a way that the kind of the word, even the word drawing, mm-hmm. has kind of, it kind of is a word that you know we we have an, all have an idea what drawing is, right? But you know, in a way, kind of it can mean anything these days. Narrative is the same, you know, um, and and in a way, like at what point does that word really help for? You know, in a way, I totally see where you're coming from, but then what we anything could be fucking narrative for that but you know what i mean yeah uh, and that, that and that's exactly like, the, that's the, the issue whole, right that's the issue it, it's it's the issue but it's a kind of tantalizing issue for like the modernist like, like just from their point of view i mean like um uh, well, there's all sorts of contradictions that we have to kind of accept the kind of in their their in abex and mm-hmm. they're not you know they are contradictions and it's i mean you know i've got, i've got some quotes from i mean i mean greenberg is kind of interesting too i mean the, the thing uh, Green, greenberg is a conflicted figure too and like there's sort of things that you really shouldn't accept from greenberg or you should be skeptical about and he contradicts himself but you know um and you know he was very much on liberal you know the whole mccarthy is sort of witch hunt against sort of modernist art as well but uh, greenberg was very much kind of trying to paint abs abex as apolitical you know purged of all dissident politics um and you know so that kind of and that's that so what we what we think of that kind of might vary you know um but you know he said painting and sculpture can become more completely nothing but what they do like functional architecture and the machine they look what they do the picture or statue exhausts itself in the visual sensation it produces there is nothing to identify connect or even think about but everything to feel now um i've talked really about like you know kitsch and like what have you but but i mean but you know in a way like you say kind of this is contradictory like you can't purge narrative no like all these things like i've said to you before kind of inherently like a bit you know insane you can't ever make a pure art there's no there, there is no pure art these this is idealism and 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 this is what we were saying like existentialism is a kind of idealism and like maybe for us like there's kind of parts of existentialism that we kind of can see in like the abexes or or even vonnegut you know they're very heavy breathing merchants of meaning they don't want you to see their work as light and you know um fun i mean there are ab- abstract artists working now who are quite open to that but they certainly weren't maybe that's just because of what was they were up against you know we're certainly people weren't even really ready to accept that it was art so like you know no this is meaningful okay this is very you know so it's almost they're trying very hard and in a way kind of we have to kind of look back and go mm, you know like does it really have to be so damned turbulent but turbulent but um uh, the um uh, the, the whole kind of like idealism and saying no we will we will be like um you know figurative as opposed to sorry we will be abstract as opposed to figurative it, it it's just this this um this this need to sort of maintain a site where you could at least have the appearance of being able to continue something uh which would, would be a response that well at, at the time it was the general problem of fascism right because the mm-hmm. modern artists had been displaced you know think about the um the burning of the Bauhaus the the staging of the entire the Kunst the the avant-garde which started in you know in Europe was was um uh, w- was disturbed and it had to in a way kind of restart itself in America but it kind of couldn't uh, I mean that's what they all wanted like let's start it again it'll be just as good but like you know already you, you can't go back you know it it's all you know it's but anyway, sorry you were you were wanting to say something. Um, well, I, I well, I mean, relevant to all this, like uh, I, so we we exchanged notes about this uh, idea. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, before just what you said earlier, like you know, like people like Vonnegut and others, like they don't necessarily want their 
uh, uh, work to be seen as light and fun. I think, you know, Vonnegut would say, well, I Vonnegut, want you. Yeah, Vonnegut, I wouldn't I, I, really I, say I, I, Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. Like I want you, he'd probably say, I want you to view my work as fun, but not light, right? Mm-hmm. Like light and fun mm-hmm. would not necessarily be, be the same, right? Although they they might have, I, I guess, to some people, similar implications. I, I don't think what, they're necessarily the same. That's what he's about Abex, I think. Yeah. It, it, yeah. In a way, it's what fascinates him about Abex, but it's also what he feels uneasy about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, like, so like relevant to this, right? So, in our notes that we exchanged, I, I mentioned um, how the beginning of the book, right? He, Vonnegut himself, right? Not under any other name, right? Not as a character, not as Ray Bill Karabakian, mm-hmm. but as himself, Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, he has an author's note uh, to the novel, mm-hmm. and uh, this is this is what he says. Um, May I say too that much of what I put in this book was inspired by the grotesque prices paid for works of art during the past century. Tremendous concentrations of paper wealth have made it possible for a few persons or institutions to endow certain sorts of human playfulness with inappropriate and hence distressing seriousness. I think not only of the mud pies of art, but of children's games as well. Running, jumping, catching, throwing, or dancing, or singing songs, and I, I found this note very interesting for for different reasons. Um, it's mm-hmm. obvious that he has, you know, a, a, I think a positive view of Abex, I guess, in general, not only throughout the text, but speci- specifically also in this note. But you could also mm-hmm. use, like, you know, to, to 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 the idea that you know Vonnegut is always sort of you know trying to have fun. You could um, interpret some of this commentary as also, you know, being uncomfortable with, with art, with uh, abacs, and not merely because of the, quote, grotesque prices paid for it, right? Um, because, you know, this idea of, uh, you know, s- certain sorts of human playfulness with inappropriate and hence distressing seriousness, um, mm-hmm. w- you know, would Vonnegut necessarily view that about his like would he would he view his own work in the same light would he view like his favorite works of literature in the same light would he um be like i i i don't think that he would be distressed right with treating it seriously right there there's almost something like by by, by you know relegating abex to mere playfulness Right. It's almost as if there is this kind of like slight against Abex, even in this note. But at the same time, like I think part of the interesting part, you know, here is that he's also defending, right, Abex. He's also trying to put a positive spin on, right? There's both of these strains going on at once. And again, I really do wonder, like, would he would he be distressed by treating the greatest works of visual art or literature? you know, uh, with, with outright seriousness, right. That's not to say that, you know, you you shouldn't, uh, uh, point out the humor in these works because there often is like you, you, you should, you, you you should always emphasize the, the, the fact that when you do create art, there needs to be some level of playfulness, like to the extent that human creativity is part of it at all, there is going to be some kind of childlike playfulness in every great work of art. It's just there, right? It, it may not always come out in the same you know ways in terms of like humor and stuff, but it's always going to be there. But I, I, I think you could use this passage to make all kinds of deductions that are both flattering and unflattering to Abex, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to to the point that you were making earlier. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I agree. I, I think that's that's kind of the interesting thing about the way he approaches sort of abstract you know it's not just um a defense of abstract art you know the whole way through like um uh, you know where he's like cosplaying the whole way through the book mm-hmm. as, as as an abstract expressionist like i said he he um, um he does kind of in a way he he does defend abstract art and he does show a kind of a sympathy for and in a way almost a, a solidarity with kind of the abstract painters um but he does sort of um there, there are sort of things that he introduces that kind of disturb kind of that reading and kind of or there's things things that you that you get the sense that Rabo the character or or um or Pro- Vonnegut like objects to but doesn't it but doesn't totally um throw out you know there, there's for instance a big part of the book that we haven't even touched on is this theme of um gender relations and sort of gender wars and machismo and sort of macho culture and in a way kind of the macho culture 
of the painters and and the abstract expressionists too because again, like i said it was like it's this kind of very he- heavy breathing very serious kind of thing and you know if you know anything about the abstract expressionists they were it was it was you know they they were quite laddish you know mm-hmm. you know um um kind of, some of them were quite educated others were were kind of less so and you know not very philosophically minded or at all but um he, he in a way kind of Vonnegut is kind of cutting up and sort of um um questioning different things I mean like for instance we see that um uh the the Dan Gregory and sort of the way that he treats um sort of um the young ingenue woman kind of like uh, Merrily yeah his Robert, his uh his Marily, mistress yeah is 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 um, a is sort of revolting sort of misogynist sort of relationship and stuff like that but like um, um the, the, there's all there's also kind of this, this sense that kind of that kind of rabbit kind of falls into actually a very macho very just like male kind of kind of i mean that is a very it's very male i mean chauvinistic kind of world kind of like yeah, it, uh, it, upon like, the uh, reunion you remember that part like with the reunion with yes, Marilee, yes, yeah, I, I, and I, mm. I think some of the best dialogue was uh, th- upon their reunion, right? Where Marilee, like, she ends up like uh, marrying uh, uh, some. I think it's it's he's presented as a uh, closeted or something, like yeah, that. yeah, or, or, yeah. Ra- or rather not not so closeted homosexual, but she sort of you mm. know she 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 enters into a marriage with him, and mm. um, uh, finally when Rabo Karabakian, who had a sexual experience with her when he was much younger, when they meet up again after the war. Uh, he, you know, he, he's sort of like pilloried by her for some of the statements that he's made, you know, basically about like, just, you know, um, being, you know, like, like this kind of machismo, right. He does take on, like you Mm -hmm. said, uh, these kinds of, um, you know, uh, 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 like thoughts and these kinds of, uh, postures. Right. And the way that she just, Mm -hmm. uh, he he is kind of a chauvinist in his own way, even though we might feel kind of like, you know, when he talks about kind of when he's like condemning the world and society and kind of like, you know, um, you know, he feels all this sort of, you know, but it, there still is this kind of conceited kind of chauvinism to like his way of looking at the world, which, mm. yeah. um, sorry, go on. Um, well, I actually, Oh, Oh, I just found it here. Cause I was, I was trying to look for the, for the passage. So, uh, w- when, when Marilee like, you know, finds uh, him. And so R- 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 Rabo and also is part of the war. Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. She, uh, I'm not sure what edition you have, but two, two, three on the first edition, the hardcover. Uh, when she talks about these medals, um, whenever I see a man wearing a medal, said Marilee, I want to cry and hug him and say, "Oh, you poor baby! All the terrible things you've been through, just mm-hmm. so the woman and children could be safe at home, mm-hmm. right?" Um, and mm-hmm. then she's, you know, she's she, she's trying to sort of make him more comfortable, right? But then she kind of puts this twist at the end. And then she brought up the unfortunate expression I had used when talking to her on the telephone. Quote, did you say that in the war you were, quote, combing pussy out of your hair? Right. And so from that point on, right, he becomes like really like ashamed of his, you know, uh, behavior. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, he, you know, he, 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 he clearly is taking on a posture that is not truly, you know, of himself, right? And you start wondering, right, to the extent that men often engage in this kind of behavior, it is often a reflection, you know, of their own lacks, of their own kind of you know, dearth of purpose. And I, I, I find this like, and it's also, it's also, it's also solipsism. In yeah, a way. exactly. And if if you think if we think about it, kind of like it's 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 the pressure to solipsism of modern life, and 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 kind of in a way that's precisely why kind of Rabo. It comes to uh, at least on the surface kind of accept abstract values because they mm-hmm. they seem in a way to actually be opposed like when we, instead of how we would think that generally there's a kind of general solipsism to the way that abstract artists might look at the world it, from Rabo's point of view it's kind of <laughs> that, that lack of kind of an objective um, you know I mean all these formal issues um uh, which are, are now, which one might consider a matter of dullness. I mean, mm-hmm. they actually do tell you a lot about seeing, whereas kind of like, you know, that chauvinistic thing, like that whole kind of pathological, I mean, like, I mean, just think of Dan Gregory and just like mm-hmm. how utterly pathological and like narrow his view of the world is. 
Like contrasted yeah. against, you know, what we're told is his formal technical brilliance. You know, he's such a small minded, little man, mm -hmm. you know, with all these boasting, all this kind of like, I am the arbiter of history. You know, I decide what's good and what's bad. I, I, and really, he's just the most reactionary little like man like ever. It's, it, you know, it's. Uh, it, it's that kind of disgust and revulsion uh, towards that. I mean, uh, that really comes through in this book in a kind of mm. Brechtian way, this kind of condemnation. Um, mm. like, in a way, I think of that Ad Reinhardt cartoon. Do you remember, like, have you seen it where the man stands in front of the abstract painting and he goes, what, do, what does this mean? And the painting grows a big pointing finger and points back at him and goes, what do you mean? Yo, what yeah. do you represent? L let me, yeah, because I was looking at this one. Let me um, uh, share that uh with i everyone. think that could almost be put on the front cover of the book and, and it'd be a perfect like encapsulation of of the of kind of like the attitude yeah but anyway I, the, 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 that's his that's his I'm a, i i love this cartoon too i think there's so much humor in this so much I, I, i'm not sure because 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 what you mentioned uh i think it might be i'm not sure if that, it's that's that's a different one this is this is well, this well, well I, I, I'm not sure because I think you're on your phone, but here in this uh, corner in the bottom, right, this kind of like oh, box yes, right here. Is. Yeah. So yes. bas basically, there's this. Uh, it looks like a house, right, with a flag on top, and there's a there's a an eagle on top, and then there's a man pointing at this thing inside, which looks like you know just kind of abex, and he, there's the text says, "Ha ha, what does uh, th this represent?" Right, and then out of this house, right, which has changed uh shape right the internally something has shifted um it's pointing back at him and says uh what do you yeah. represent right yeah. um so yeah th this 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 is the the cartoon right and in general uh, the, the the cartoon uh because you know i'm looking at a wiki art right so it's easier to see but yeah. for, for yeah. anyone that's that's having a hard time basically it's like there's a large tree on the tree says uh brock Matisse, picasso right as the as the trunk you have the roots of Cezanne, Seurat, Gaglin, uh, Van Gogh, um, and all, all the like little leaves, right? On the left side mm. are, you know, more increasingly abstract. And what's sprouting out on the right side is getting closer and closer to what we might term illustration, right? And the his Yeah, there's a big, there's a big sort of yeah. bow that's <laughs> it's so it's so so bitchy, isn't it? Like there's a big rotten bow that's like weighed down by like different things. He's got there's also this other cartoon he does. Like um, this is it's so, I think you just go. You would never know he had this sort of sense of humor just from looking at his paintings, would you? Like all that he had all these kind of um kind of tongue in cheek ideas about abstraction. But there's a famous cartoon he does where there's a train coming along, and um uh, there's um uh, there's like a little boy who's enabled um modern art. And um, uh, there's there's a little girl like leaping over the fence to rescue him, and she's labeled mm -hmm. abstraction. <laughs> like mm -hmm. the joke is that abstractions come to save modern. Okay. But it's in a way, it's just so over the top that kind of you can't help but think like there's something kind of ironic about this, you know? Like like there, there's there's a they, you know obviously you know they feel very sincere about what they're doing, but that there's there's all these sort of contradictions that these painters are aware of, and kind of in a way kind of. They carry on regardless. I mean, obviously, um, you know, I mean, I don't agree with everyone who's like put on this tree and such and such, but like mm -hmm. it, it just kind of shows you kind of the way they're thinking. I mean, a lot of people, when when they look at uh, art, most critics are unable or unwilling to see things in the art that disturb the surface level, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's impossible for some to see the work of like, say, Jeff Koons. Uh, in any way as a continuation of what Cezanne's doing of like his visual traditions right I mean they could only see that as some sort of disturbance or a or a dumb provocation um uh, like I said kind of like it's always like these critics always just want to use kind of the arts to talk about something else um and so I can come down on a side but it, it really is the case that you know I mean uh painting or even even a novel isn't um just a set of behaviors you know, it's a constructed thing, and, and and the construction does expose the ideology, but but in a way, the, the, this is by virtue of its own inner necessity. Since painting, you know, as a form, can't help but constantly process and reprocess its own means. You know, there are things that just painting can't ever get away from, and kind of, well, we just have to accept. You know, whether we like it or fucking not. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, we might, you know, we can all sit and scratch our chins, going, well. Are brushstrokes any good? What's so good about fucking brushstrokes? You know, 
if we really put our thinking hats on and go, what's good about about lardy stuff being smeared around? You're like, but the moment we do that, you know, painting's over. You know, we can't, painting can't ever not be that. You know, yeah. or you and know, you can, I, I, we, it's, we can it's, or rather it's, we can have painting that removes brushstrokes and you know, but but you know, there there is always kind of like this stuff at, at play, kind of in art, where kind of you know, there there are things that at work beneath the surface. You know, sorry, <laughs> it's ahead. probably easier to see what you're saying. Um, you know, kind of like through subtraction. Like I, I'm not sure if I sh- uh, said this uh, publicly, but I remember like one time for my uh, for my grandma's birthday, I decided to get her a uh, what I thought would be a, a pretty good reproduction of uh, a Winslow Homer painting, and instead I got some complete you know piece of shit looking thing and immediately what i did was i was like all right so i know this painting pretty well i pulled it up just like just on my phone and i zoomed in you know like one of those like sites like wiki art that really lets you see kinds of things like in a lot of detail and i i, I zoomed in on like on a patch of uh ocean in this uh mm-hmm. i think the painting was um uh i think it's called moonlit island or something and yeah. I, I compared just the brushwork, just just the brushwork, just completely mm-hmm. zoomed in, zoomed in enough that essentially, you know, we could, you might as well be, be able to like, you know, mistake it for an Abax painting. And I compared that mm-hmm. patch to the patch to the to the patch in the painting that I received, and you you see right away through that mm-hmm. kind of subtraction what exactly is good in a Winslow Homer that can't be, you know, copied by a guy that's just kind of, you know, trying to copy something by hand, yet doesn't have the skill, doesn't have the finesse, right? Doesn't have the technique. Mm. So I think oftentimes through subtraction alone, you get some of that. Um, And also to to like get back a little Mm. bit to what you were talking about, masculinity, uh, there's also this interesting part in the book near the end uh, after he's you know, after basically he reveals uh, the painting that he's working on or that he worked on to uh, mm-hmm. Cersei Berman, um, she asks him about, you know, how he felt uh, when the various Abex painters that he knew, you know, died or committed suicide or whatever. And this is, and he said that actually I didn't really have much of a feeling about it. And this is the way that he characterizes it. So the reason why this is interesting to me is, you know, to the extent that there are men that are misogynistic and there are men who have this kind of like internal lack, that is not only going to come out in the relationships that they have with women, it's also going to come out in the relationships that they have with each other. And I I found this kind of enigmatic. This uh, So uh, this is page 293 to anyone following along uh, in the first edition of the text, the bottom paragraph. So the way that he answers uh, Berman's question about whether or not he he misses them is as follows. We'd, We'd stop being friends long before then, I said. It was all the boozing we did together that made people call us that, meaning the Three Musketeers. It didn't have anything to do with painting. We could have been plumbers. One or the other of us would stop drinking for a little while, and sometimes all three of us. And that was that for the Three Musketeers long before the other two killed themselves, right? And and that's interesting to me because, I mean, the only thing I can think of is, you know, when I was younger and uh, uh, I, I used to have friendships that were like, you know, largely based oh, on our think, shared yeah. marijuana habits, right? Like when you're really small, it's based mm. on like proximity, right? You're friends with people that are, you know, that you grew up with next to. When you get older and, you know, you have other interests or if you have like drug interests, you know, yeah, that's a common you thing, right? Finding like, like, yeah, like, like yeah, p- people that are into weed, for example, right? They start, you know, they, they're able yeah. to sniff out very easily other people that smoke weed. They get together. Mm-hmm. And that's all the friendship is based mm-hmm. on. When one of them stops smoking weed, the friendship is mm-hmm. it's not there any longer. So it, it, it struck me as kind of odd that, okay, so in this book that is, you know, it does defend on some level Abex. I think this is true. He, the, the, the story that we get at the end is, these people kind of like have a friendship that dissipates despite the fact that they're, they share what's supposed to be the deepest thing ever, right? Their shared appreciation of art. Despite this fact, it seems like the friendship dissipates regardless. Like I, I can't help but, but view that also in this complex way that, yeah. that he's sort of, you know, viewing Abex here. This is also perhaps in some way a slight against whatever project these people are, are a part of, right? I mean, it, it's hard to read any other way. I'm not sure if you had any other interpretation of that passage or what. Um, no, if only to say that, you know, it's, I mean, it's very much part of like, the tabloid 
history as well as you know um that um of abex that you know they were you know, they were um there was a lot of alcohol and you know and cigarettes you know we ought to mention that too because franz klein died of um oral cancer um mm. uh and like you know they were all smoking cigarettes um it's you know there, there was you know, bad behavior mm-hmm. was was so there was a lot of bad behavior and and you know there was there, there was a lot of kind of women artists who were sidelined and kind of um a lot of work that was done by the wives of artists where you know like um de kooning's wife and of course um, um jackson pollock's wife who i've unforgivably forgotten the the, the name of so, um bloody hell uh <laughs> i remember uh, i remember soon but um, krasner me krasner mm-hmm. um where, where a lot of them really the most of most of the of the kind of praise they get is like posthumous you know so kind of again this sort of that sort of again ties in with the theme of kind of you know women being being trampled over by kind of men and, and what have you sort of especially kind of men who fancy themselves as geniuses mm-hmm. uh, it's um in a way that's a kind of a big trope of modern art history you know we're, we're kind of used to kind of the story of kind of the you know picasso and even to a certain degree matisse i mean matisse gets it pretty light but matisse slept with more women than picasso and mm-hmm. um uh, you know um, but had probably more affairs you know what like uh but um but yeah i i think kind of that's 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 also something that kind of he's trying to sort of call attention to i mean maybe maybe it's also kind of the fact that um it's this sort of in a way this cultural repression it also gets linked to people, you know, post-war, ex-military survivors. You know, how do you know how how do we actually come to terms with our emotions and how we have all this bullshit we're feeling about kind of this stuff? And it's um, what you know when, as a man, kind of you know, there's a certain way of behaving the same way as there is for women, I suppose, too. But um, yeah, do, I, mean, do, I don't do, really do, do have much the, more do, to add to that. Do you know off the top of your head whether? Um... Uh, abex painters uh had like higher rates of you know either suicide or self-destructive behavior compared to like you know because yeah, i mean, I mean it, it's, it's it's common well, oh, right in the oh, arts right yeah but, yeah well yeah i mean like um of, of course like a lot of um, many of them if, if, if you're if, if you're a 20th century painter who committed suicide i mean you, you're probably pretty well known like it's all people quite mm-hmm. like the sensational like like i said it's like a tabloid kind of thing I mean, um, if if um, Von Gogh hadn't sliced off his ear and you know mm-hmm. shot himself in the stomach, um, or whoever shot him, you know, um, would would we be talking about him? I'd like to think we 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 would, but it's it's the but you know your question was kind of is it kind of proportionally? Not, yeah, you know, as as a movement, you know, it was a pretty toxic play. So, mm-hmm. and it was competitive you know you, um, um everyone was competing to be as successful as de kooning and it ne- no one ever quite you know he had quite a lot of people helping him as well like his wife and like harold rosenberg yeah. and and uh and you know it already you know like like uh, like i said to in our correspondence you know there was a lot ag- against the abstract expressionists where people thought you know oh, they're just trying to be controversial or, you know anyone could do that and you know they so they had to kind of really earnestly like find a gimmick or kind of find a re- mm-hmm. so find someone who really believed in them or you know um yeah like a very pressurized very pressurized kind of moment for kind of modern american art you know especially because you know it really kind of was a flash in the pan like mm-hmm. uh, like it, you know it's this goes from being an obscure thing to being a quite chic thing where people where in, overnight it becomes commodified and you know um the nouveau riche kind of like um, um pe- you know people with like all this expendable income and what have you like uh, with like with these manhattan offices to decorate are suddenly buying these paintings for ludicrous prices and you know it becomes fashionable and you know um, um rothko is getting commissioned by the four seasons and uh, he doesn't mm. really know whether how to feel about the idea of these paintings which he really does you know god bless him he feels a very kind of important and kind of you know uh, yeah, perhaps he, he places a bit he's a bit you know too you know again like that heavy breathing you know mean merchant of meaning thing he doesn't like the idea of them people eating their their asparagus underneath his paintings he's like that's wrong you know and um so, so like it's you know it's it's like it's that these are repressed people kind of like in a world that they don't really recognize or understand 
that's who the Avexes are. You know, I, I don't think that's the essential thing with the Avex painters. I think, like I was saying to you in our correspondence, I think this is the thing that gets in the way of our appreciation of the Avexes. This whole, you know, in a way we can't really get away from it. But uh, if if we're if we're kind of if we're if, but if we're, if we're kind of just people who are curious about art or kind of we're, we're trying to find out more, kind of we kind of have to, have to all accept it uncritically. Oh yeah, these guys were really you know kind of like um uh, uh they, they were all like Van Gogh, you know they were all kind of slightly mad, and, you know they um uh, they they were starving and they, so they made all these paintings and then lots no one wanted, you know we don't like to think that maybe kind of um that may be kind of uh i don't know like but i i kind of forget what we're talking about now but no i i we we don't like to think maybe that there was all kinds of different stuff going into the paintings and all kinds of stuff that connects it to 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 other kind of to to traditions about visual traditions and what have you like and not just some kind of disruption of it but yeah it is true generally that kind of there was a big self-destructive streak among these painters and kind of a, a slightly kind of self-sabotaging thing with these guys. And kind of maybe that's to do with the generational kind of thing. Maybe it's to do with the rapidly changing landscape of America. Maybe it's to do with kind of, um, you, you know, like, what do you do when you become a, 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 a wealthy overnight? What happens mm. when you win the lottery overnight? Most people yeah, exactly. Self self destruction. Yeah, yeah the, the the novel that I'm working on is you know uh, is is probably based around these ideas. You know, like what what, what happens to like what ha it's, it's a book probably about money. What happens to people? You know, when they get money, right? This is nowadays a, we know it. You know, it's, it's a it's fascinating like, like examination. Market. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is fascinating. But nowadays we have the art market. You know, it's 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 perfectly. You know, whereas in their time, you know, the art market that we recognize today was only really just emerging quietly like uh, oh like and and um, um i mean people you can you can go online and find documentaries where Rausch, robert rauschenberg is like um uh, uh what's the what's the name of that chap leo castelli that huge mm -hmm. new york guy like he turns up to an auction and like he sold his work to castelli and castelli sells it for like 10 times the price and the look on rauschenberg's face as it sinks in sat there in the auction house his, it's like his soul has been torn in two because mm -hmm. Castelli walks up to him with a big smile on his face, big shit eating grin and shakes his hand. And, you know, like you think, my God, imagine that. I mean, I can only imagine that, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, but, but like, um, uh, it's, it's, a, but I mean, maybe a bit off topic, but like this, this is kind of the, the, the weirdness. Like it's an, yeah. it's a, a market that we recognize today that kind of is in everything now. It's not exclusive to art. You know, it's like, um, uh, yeah, that that techno commercial world it was only just emerging and kind of it obviously it captures all this kind of complicated idealism that's going on in mm. in um, you know this new modern art scene recommensurates it to its values you know so i, I think this of this obviously this theme of money on commerce is there in bluebeard right from the start with the you know, the the the, par the the parable in a way of the ruble like yeah. So man, yeah, you know. yeah. So, so you, you, we both had comments here on that. Why, why don't you yeah. actually? You know, let, let's um, let, let's it. just let, just give like a brief kind of like a. We should have done this at the beginning, but uh, like a brief synopsis of the novel, right? So it, it, it kind of you know just like with most of Ivanka's books, right? It kind of jumps around uh, in time, right? But to to give a kind of like accounting like from. <laughs> Yeah, from like beginning to end, right? So Rabo Karabakian, he is uh, the son of an Armenian immigrant who mm. uh, comes to the United States, to uh, California specifically, after the Armenian genocide, right? He uh, pretends that he's uh, uh, dead, right? So he's able to uh, escape. Um, and they, so they make it to California. Uh, early on, he learns that he is a, a ta you know, he's talented technically as an artist, Right, so mm -hmm. he eventually uh, comes under the tutelage of um, uh, Dan Gregory. His actual Dan Gregory, is, yeah, yeah. His actual name is Dan Gregorian, right? Also an Armenian, mm -hmm. and uh, his father yeah. insists, like, okay, you need to, you know, uh, go under this guy. Like, if you know, the, like he's he has like a lot of like ethnic pride, right? So maybe he's going to help you mm -hmm. out. Marily is the one that's constantly writing these letters uh, as if they're coming from Dan Gregory. And yes, um, yes. so this is how this kind of apprenticeship uh, uh, begins, right? And merrily and it's kind and, of uh, yeah. Like, might I just sorry to interject, but like it almost sets up this theme. We almost expect the theme is going to be, you know, um, 
and you know it would be a passable thing you know, behind every great man you know blah 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 but i think that in a way that's almost complicated by cersei berman because in, mm. in a way she is kind of like a high successful person but anyway just to say that kind of like that that's yeah. there this, this kind of thing go go yeah. on with your continue with your synopsis please yeah so so merrily um you know eventually uh, gets his apprenticeship uh, for him and um one of the things that dan gregory right who himself is a fascist he's a big fan of mussolini Right. This is like one of the kind of, you know, uh, like in terms of like aesthetic critiques. Right. Obviously, like we all know, know now, right, when it comes to like Soviet realism or the kinds of aesthetics in either mm. Italy's fascist party or Nazism. Right. There's this yeah, kind man. of, a, a, yeah, there's this a uh, high preference for, you know, um, you can't say photorealism, but definitely realism. Right. Everything else is considered degenerate. Right. That's a common refrain all throughout history. So, um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, but kind of, kind of really patronizing kind of yeah. realism. I mean, I, I would call, I would call it more or less kitsch, but like it, it, that kind of, you know, like um, yeah, really patronizing kind yeah. of. Yeah, we, we we should talk about photorealism in a little bit after the synopsis because I I think that's uh sure, that's sure. also like that's also like I think part of this that that we could talk about in terms of this critique. So anyway, so uh, he becomes his apprentice. And Merrily and uh, uh, Raybo, they start to develop what is eventually kind of like this uh, brief, like romantic fling, right? Most of it is kind of uh, lived out through the experience of going to the Museum of Modern Art, right? Which um, uh, Dan uh, Gregory, he tells them, you cannot go to this museum, right? One of the uh, rules for being my apprentice is you cannot go to this museum, right? He considers it offensive, right? Uh, he, he And when he discovers them, right, he completely kind of loses his mind. Um, so uh, eventually, uh, Raybo, he ends up going to war, World War II, He's part of this camouflage unit. Uh, he, you know, yeah. create. He he characterizes as he creates illusions, right, for uh, uh, the Germans, yeah. right. He uh, so kind of using, I guess, like in some way, his his artistic talent to to deal with, deal with war in that way. Um, mm -hmm. And so he returns. Uh, he becomes a painter himself. He mm -hmm. realizes that hey, you know, like I'm not actually. A, a good painter, but I can make money in the stock market. I could, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, help uh, move this, uh, 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 you know, artistic movement of Abex forward by funding artists that I respect. So he becomes this like big art dealer as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and eventually he's uh, accosted by this uh, C.C. Berman, right? Who kind of comes to him early on. He's living in uh, Long Island. She's also mm. a, a writer, right? Uh, he, uh, she wor she's working under an assumed name, right? So, and and yeah. she, and her aesthetic is very different from Raybo, right? Raybo is very abex. She is uh, not only does she you know like you know per personally, she enjoys um, uh, realism. She enjoys like a very kitschy form of realism, right? And yeah, yeah. and you know, she tries to like recreate this guy's apartment. Um, and he has so Raybo has a barn right, part of his property that he doesn't allow anybody in, right? He has like multiple padlocks. And ultimately mm -hmm. what he's hiding there is his, you know, his, his, his life's like greatest work, right? The painting that he was working on, that he actually finished, locked it up, never worked on a piece, a piece of art ever again. In fact, like when he, early on, when he starts doodling, right? He takes his pencil and he breaks it, right? And he says, it, it was as if it's a it was a snake that was trying to, to to poison me, right? He wants nothing to do with the creation of art. Um, ironically, though, when he does, you know, and this is like this is again like in terms of like complicating this narrative of like, oh, this is a book that's like very like pro abex. Well, the painting that both C.C. Berman and Hick, he comes to realize this as well as a great painting. Uh, it's not, oh, you know, it, there's probably, we don't, we don't see it obviously. Right. But he does describe it. It seems to be a work of expressionism, which, you know, expressionism has, you know, small a abstraction, but it's not abex, right. There's, there's definitely like some level of realism involved or at least representation. Um, so anyway, and that's more or less how, how the book ends, right. Where isn't, the, isn't, that isn't is the a painting, revelation. The painting, the painting is quite meticulous though, from what, yes. from what we gather from the book is this big, yeah. complicated, meticulous, mm -hmm. figurative representation, representational painting. And it's, it's, um, 
uh, but but you said we you wanted uh, to talk about um, realism or um, you know photorealism. Oh yeah, yeah, so, know, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Photorealism I, is, I would a, just is say an interesting that, topic. You know, I, I don't know if um, I'd say that photorealism per se um, comes into this book in sort of any meaningful way, kind of that I can think. I mean, that for instance, when he's reproducing the ruble, well, yeah, you know, a ruble, you know, you don't need to photograph, make that like a photograph that you can just draw it and it would sort of be convincing. It's, but we, we, I don't know. It has know. to be lifelike, right? I mean, to, to the extent of photorealism uh, is ruble, lifelike, though, right? Well, yeah, but a, a ruble is just like, you know, there's already, or, or I don't know what a ruble looks like, to be honest, but like, a, you know, <laughs> yeah. paper money, yeah. paper money is all like, you know, just complicated patch drawings and stuff. So it's just, it's not technically photorealism because if it's, if you're drawing a drawing, uh, but and, but do, you, the, do you remember what he had to do for um, for uh, do, Dan Gregory? The, yeah, that's Dan Gregory's story. And Robert Karabekin's story, um, thing is that he has to paint um, the um, Dan Gregory study, doesn't he? Yeah, the, the, the room in a, in a way that is absolutely, you know, as close to capturing, you know, it's it's photorealistically, right? That's kind of like, you know, he starts, like Rabel begins almost as a photorealistic pain, right? He does have like an aesthetic transition from, you know, like purely technical photorealism to abax to this expressionistic thing that he does at the end of the book, right? Or that is locked up in, in the barn, right? Which is where the term bluebeard comes from. Um, so like to the extent that photorealism does I think, play I that think, role. I think- yeah, I think I think the word photorealism is 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 um is is very specific though. Like um re- realism, I, I I would say that is you know lifelike and sort of like convincing and do it because because photo photorealistic um paintings are paintings that look like photographs. Yeah, they're not paintings that look like real life or like but they're paintings that look like photo photographic reproductions or ape sort of photos. Whereas, but that's not what um Rabo's doing he's not painting from photographs he's painting from from life or from from the thing itself so but I, so it, so it's a, that's just my technical sort of i would say that um what we do know though is that Rabo is very very technically good at getting someone's likeness or drawing mm-hmm. things looking absolutely like he we know that he's um technically sort of just brilliant kind of at drawing that sort of stuff and doesn't even have to think you can do it effortlessly, mm-hmm. and, and those stories that you know the the whole story of the ruble with Dan Gregory, you know his story of how I became a master draftsman. Yeah, I had to go through this trial, you know, with my um, with my master, and now I will put you through a trial where mm-hmm. you have to do this seemingly impossible task. It, it it sort of brings to my mind, you know, like all these sort of stories from history. I think I was telling you, you know, there's a story about from Pliny about kind of you know um, some competition between ancient Greek um Greek um sort of painters where at the end of it a bird flies down yeah. to snatch a bit of fruit yeah. from the from the painting and it's and like the grapes I think, it. or something yeah 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 and and like smacks against the wall and the, this is you know like oh you know <laughs> but uh mm. and you know there's others Vasari tells stories too about you know a story about Giotto kind of like um he the Pope sort of asks to see something impressive and he does a perfect so you know all these kind of like so so in a way kind of Rabo has to go through almost this kind of um a similar kind of almost mythic kind of thing like uh like this trial in order to get where he gets yeah. but it's it's um, um but obviously it's you know it's um, um and and it's this kind of uh i think it's, it's for me it's my favorite part of the book i love it and i think it, it's almost like all the all the values of the book are in there in that kind of little thing where dan gregory is the bluebeard of the title i think you know, he he's he's this kind of monster, kind of in his sort of house with all his ancestral portraits and guns. You know, and he's like, and there's this idea, there's this danger. Certainly, there's this danger in Rabo's mind that he will become Bluebeard too. Mm-hmm. That he will become just as kind of horrible as him, and he really doesn't want that. In a way, kind of his whole life is about trying to avoid that. Um, yeah, it's a good way of viewing that. I, I didn't look at it in that way, but I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, uh, but but especially because Dan Gregory tries in a way to kind of mold 
um, him into a version like you know he's kind of here i will put you through the same trial i went through and then he's all like i'm uh, bombarding him with yeah. his opinions oh well, democracy is shit women are yeah. unreliable you know like yeah. i'm a uh, don't you think these things yeah and he because he doesn't know anything you know he just has to go yeah, yeah i accept this i accept yeah. this and he does he accepts it I mean, in a way you like the story from his point of view retrospectively is him looking back and cringing and going my god shit you know mm. like can you what can you imagine but in a way you know I, it, it's fascinating i almost see it as the anti-whiplash you know Whereas whiplash mm. is, you know, that story is all about measuring up, you know, oh, it, I, in a kind of quite, in a way, reactionary way for me, kind of like, oh, uh, it, it, does it matter uh, if, if, if there's suffering and pain, kind of like, uh, if, if the art's good, sorry, to, to sounds like an almost crude, vulgar way of saying the plot, but like weighing up suffering and pain against great art and kind of, you know, mm, which equivocating between that sort of thing, in a way, like Vonnegut kind of, turns that on its head in the story so it's, yeah yeah it, it re- re-complicates that it doesn't allow us even kind of the the thing of kind of ooh, who do you side with you know it's um but but no i definitely think that's the, dan gregory is bluebeard you know and, and but you know and when we find rabba karabekin he kind of almost is inadvertently kind of like an inverted image of dan gregory yeah you know, he's kind of in his house mm-hmm. with all his kind of paintings kind of like shut away kind of like has all this weirdness about women and the world like mm-hmm. quite in his, in his own way quite conceited but he has this opportunity in a way to kind of you know um re-enter the world sort of like like you know um um you know sounds corny to say a second chance but sort of sort of really sort of uh see himself as a social being you know somewhat kind of inner you know like um uh, whereas before kind of like abstract art, which is this thing which liberates him and gives him kind of hope in a way, kind mm-hmm. of in a way also puts him at an icy distance from kind of the world too. And kind of like um, uh, insulates him from a lot of kind of like, a lot of, you know, like why we're saying kind of there's, there's this kind of repression and this sort of complicated feelings of sort of guilt and shame and um, 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 uh, uh, shall, shall we say, our solipsism too? Because in a way, Rabbi Karabekin really is beyond taste or caring. Yeah, you know, at this point, you know, like I mean, he, he, he's, he's, he's. We know that he's one of the most skilled draftsmen who's ever lived. In a way, he can just like in like in Greece in a window draw like an absolutely amazing portrait. But mm-hmm. it, it's not enough. He doesn't. He doesn't care. You know, it doesn't matter to him like whether his art impresses people or, or what. what it, it's and no, but anyway, like this. This is kind of um, this is kind of the whole problem. And, and a Vonnegut kind of in a way kind of puts us in that in that position too. He's like because think about it. When we read Breakfast of Champions, we don't know that Rabbi Karabikin is this talented. We don't. We're given no clue that Rabbi Karabekin is some sort of, um, um, you know, amazing sort of traditional draftsman. Like that's the big twist of this story in a way. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, you know, you might have, you know, uh, it, it, he's not some sort of ridiculous man. Like I'm a kind of, I'm a putting up like a, uh, <laughs> like a, he's, he's, he's kind of a complicated guy. And it, he's, he's, he's kind of, um, <laughs> God, I sound like twerp. He, he, uh, he's a complicated guy, but you know, he is. And um, um, I think he, he stands for the complicated, contradictory values of modernity, you know, of modern art, modern life, um, if you like modern masculinity too. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and um, what else then? <laughs> yeah, so, so um, j- just a, a few things, uh, like j- just, uh, I guess, a more minor uh, thing. Like, this is like much more of a conceptual discussion than just like of the book itself. So, just uh, sure. from like a, a writerly uh, perspective, uh, especially like with your, you know, twist that really it's Dan Gregory who's uh, the actual Bluebeard. Um, you know, there, there, like there's a there's a part early on in the book where uh, Kurt Vonnegut is, uh, you know, he has a rainbow uh, essentially. Um, you know, just describe this, you know, the story of Bluebeard in a very kind of like prosaic fashion, like, you know, you know, who Bluebeard was. And it struck me as very unnecessary because 
First of all, um, most people are probably have some kind of passing familiarity with who Bluebeard is. It's not necessary mm -hmm. to do so. If you do go on and describe the story, uh, you shouldn't do it in a way that's just kind of like, you know, um, prosaic and and simple and not really adding much overall, right? Which is what happens, unfortunately, in Vonnegut's novel, right? It's not necessarily very well done. Uh, it would have been, you know, even str stronger, uh, not only to just like cut out the entire section of like describing like that, but by omitting that and also, you know, on the one hand, like making it sort of obvious that, well, since he has his barn, that's all locked up you know, on some level, uh, uh, you know, Raybo is, is Bluebeard, but then also by implication, right, Dan Gregory, who is in some ways a kind of like progenitor uh, of uh, of Raybo and also someone that Raybo could in some ways like become uh, down the line, right, that would have that would have been a, a bit more powerful, right? And I, I think that actually the novel is like full of situations like that, right, where um, uh, like uh, you have a section that could have, ended very nicely but instead we have like an additional sentence right or we have just like something else that's not totally uh necessary right so like, one example that i have here um that so like a after basically he's confronted by uh dan gregory like somewhere like in the top staircase uh dan gregory is like telling this this story to to Rabo, right and there's two things that happen here that i think are worth noting uh, first of all, there's an unnecessary final line that is both kind of, you know, I guess like a mild kind of like almost idiomatic cliche, but also it's a good kind of illustration of some of the kind of artistic concepts that are being played with. And this is sort of, you know, uh, uh, done, you know, through the text uh, beyond just being something that's conceptually discussed, right? It's also done technically, right, in a kind of rivalry basis. So this is what Dan Gregory says. My father was only one year older than you are when I was born, said Dan Gregory. If you start calculating right now, you too can have a squalling baby by the time you're 18 in a big city like this one and far from home. You think you're going to set the city on its ear as an artist, do you? Well, my father thought he was going to set Moscow on its ear as a horse trainer. And then he found out quickly enough that the horse world there was run by Polacks and that the highest he was ever going to rise, no matter how good he was, was to the rank of lowest stable boy. He had stolen my mother away from her people and all she knew when she was only 16, promising her that they would soon be rich and famous in Moscow. He stood and faced me. I had not budged from the top of the stairs. The new rubber heels I had put on my old broken shoes were cantilevered in air past the lip of the top step. So reluctant was I to come any far farther into this dumbfoundingly complex and mirrored environment. Dan Gregory himself was only a head and hands now, since his captain was black. The head said to me, so just like in terms of the images, right? There's almost like a, you know, a Francis Bacon kind of thing going on, right? With like disembodied, you know, heads and stuff, uh, you know, abac stuff, uh, you know, you, you could imagine like, a, you know, a, a Kandinsky gloomy situation type of painting. Um, and, you know, so like th th that is being sort of, you know, processed in the text itself. So the head said to me. Also, yeah. yeah, kind of like, kind of like a mon sort of monstrous in, in a way, kind yeah, of like yeah. the way we're getting Dan Gray, almost this kind of, yeah. You know, hair like uh like a like he's some sort of fan, phantom in a beckett play you know just mm -hmm. this kind of like this this horrible kind of like just um uh, ranting voice and this kind mm -hmm. of like you know uh, but go go ahead yeah so the head said to me i was born in a stable like jesus christ and i cried like this from his throat came a harrowing counterfeit of the cries of an unwanted baby who could do nothing but cry and cry to me, that's like a perfect way to end the chapter, but instead there's a following line. My hair stood on end, right? You know, it, it, it's it's like, it's something that Vonnegut basically would not have done, you know, several novels before this one, right? He would not have, he would not have had like a an excellent ending to a chapter and then just unnecessarily sort of, you know, twisted in some way. Um, but anyway, no, like, I, you know, I, there, I there's a couple things like that. that. I don't know about that. Do you, do you remember, um, um, do you remember in, um, well, no, I take your point. Sometimes it does feel like, you know, um, in some of his lesser works, he he does kind of like 
strain an image or something like that. But I think, yeah. you know, what, what you're talking about, he does do in his best novels, like Sort House Five, you know, um, um, my favorite part of Sort House Five is um, where um, it's the section where Billy Pilgrim's in the Tralfamadorian Zoo and, you know, um, um, they ask him, you know, what have you learned on Tralfamador? And he goes, oh, it's such, so peaceful. And there's such harmony here. You know, on Earth, we're just violent animals and we kill each other all the time. I've seen mm-hmm. bodies boiled in water towers in Dresden, human fats, r- fat running down the streets. You know, um, um, tell me the secret to your utopia um, so I can take it back and we can we can save our society before we destroy ourselves and the rest of the universe. And all the Tralfamadorians laugh and they go, we know how the universe is going to end. We destroy it. And you're like, um, uh, and he says, "Oh, right. Um, uh, uh, we're always going to destroy it. Um, um, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you cope with that?" And he says, "Oh, well, what we do is we focus on the good things. We don't dwell on the bad things. We choose to look at the good things. If you humans could choose to look at the good things, then you'd have it all sorted." And that section of the novel ends with Billy Pilgrim going with the line saying, "Um," said Billy Pilgrim. <laughs> you know, so yeah. he, he he does this sometimes. Where kind but, of like, but but you know, but but I, mean, but I mean that that um is is kind of a I like in that context I would take it as you know Billy Pilgrim like either you know like just it's just not, sort, we we know this novel's not as good as Sort of House Five but it's a yeah. similar kind of thing but not done as well where kind of you know he's yeah but like this um, but like but like don't you think this is kind of like a you know maybe not a naked cliche but it's a bit of an idiomatic cliche at least here right. You know what I mean? The the um is kind of the opposite of that in some ways. You know what I mean? Opposite in some ways, the same in other ways. It's, it's, um, it, yeah, it's idiomatic, it's but, a, it's it's not, but it's not. But it's not a cliche. A you know what degree. I mean? It's a difference. Yeah. If only just to say that you know you said that sort of sort of stuff doesn't happen in other vulnerable works. You know, I, I'd I'd say it does to a degree, but like like I was saying, it doesn't work as strongly as like the um. Yeah. But it's a similar kind of um. That's yeah. that's some um, uh, that's some um, that's a von- <laughs> it's von- so that's Rabo rather. Mm. The names are kind of strangely Rabo Karabeki and Kurt Vonnegut, but I mean obviously mm. uh, Vonnegut's not. But it's him. It, that's that's some um, Rabo going um like um, and yeah, you know, it we have we we see that juxtaposed throughout kind of his reminiscing about sort of Dan Gregory. He looks back at the mm. way he was listening to Dan Gregory and sort of like sort of um being a sycophant to him and he it, he's revolted by it and he's um, um and he, he obviously feels a lot of shame about everything that kind of happened well basically the way in which he he believes that he caused Cersei Berman to get kicked out and whatever and in a way not Cersei Berman um Marilyn Lee um and in a way Marilyn Lee even kind of believes that she he was the cause or whatever even though I don't think he really was or he gets and he, he's kind of cut it unfairly mm. but um yeah, I, I. What, what else were we were we saying about that? That kind of like, um, I, I, I don't know if like um, Vonnegut is some is some great kind of stylist where he can you know he can use imagery you know amazingly convincingly. I think usually where he's quite spare and you know where he's quite where he's suggestive, he's very very good. But, yeah. You know, like it, it, when it's, when he tries more to paint picture, like he, or he, even he doesn't have those, elaborate. Yeah. Yeah. I think even when he tries to make more elaborate visual metaphors, like in Sort of House Five, you know, with the whole metaphor of the guy with the helmet with the lead pipe, and you can only look at different segments of the mountain individually. Sometimes I think that that's kind of that could have been better. But um, ag- again, like um, like this this whole thing with um, um, there, there's also that other passage as well where Dan Gregory is talking to Rabo. And he's, um, um, it's basically, you know, him talking to himself, wanting to hear, you know, the, um, you know, um, women are like this, democracy is like this, that's like, and and the dialogue runs, I said, he said, I said, it, you know, it, it's very kind of like mm-hmm. plodding pedestrian kind of stuff. It's, it's not very flashy and it's not, anyway, it's, you know, as literature, you know, it's not, it doesn't call attention to itself in this kind of amazingly showy stylistic way and, mm-hmm. and could have a could use a bit more flourish or even a bit more kind of um but that that's kind of um yeah i mean it's it's kind of some what, yeah it's kind the of way what they get you, with vonnegut yeah, yeah. That vonnegut the way they described it of, his work yeah yeah well vonnegut like again we that's this is kind of the weirdness with vonnegut he's like a pop he's like a pulp writer originally and kind of that sort of that populist 
sort of broad style is always there with him. Mm. And these kind of these kind of um this sort of whole postmodern sort of ironic sort of sensibility sort of sort of comes in gradually and sort of like what we get is a kind of weird melding of those styles in his in his work you know kind of like I often think that's kind of you know he's halfway between I mean this 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 doesn't sound very charitable to Vonnegut but he's halfway between someone like um you know Thomas Pynchon and uh, Philip K Dick in a way in what they what he's trying to achieve Although, like you know, without their kind of ha- philosophical hang-ups and um, um, and uh, prejudices, like he trying to do is very much his own thing. Um, but you know, he's he's kind of a broad kind of populist writer. He you know, he he um, uh, you know he's yeah he you know he's not writing in sort of highly refined style that kind of like only a few people really are going to be able to read. But neither is he he's also quite happy to alienate you in other ways too. Mm. You know, he's also quite happy to sort of, um, but then that, that's the, that's the kind of thrill of Vonnegut, I think, but yeah. like, um, not to get off track, we were talking about, um, Dan Gregory and we were talking about, um, sort of the, I mean, this is my favorite part of the novel, this whole bit kind of where he's remembering his apprenticeship. Like I said, the, uh, and I think Dan Gregory is actually a really good character, you know, again, kind of hateful, but very vivid, kind of um a slightly um i mean very very um in a way almost like a cartoon but you know um there, there are people who are like this in a way and kind of there used to be a lot more um and sort of when i made my reading of it kind of i was even sort of illustrating it with various sort of things that you know from the time he wasn't alone um and the way that he thought about modern art or women or what have you in a way he's kind of a he perfectly kind of sums up a lot of kind of the prevailing attitudes of the time in America kind of um, towards, um, you know, um, social attitudes, sort of aesthetic concerns, what have you. I mean, in a way, sort of his rejection of Dan Gregory is kind of a rejection of, in a certain way of kind of uh, American society to a degree or a condemnation, at least, of society in a kind of a, a, a Brechtian kind of, I mean, I said to you, kind of like, I've just compared him to Pynchon and um Philip K. Dick. So let me remedy that by by comparing um, Vonnegut to Brecht. I think mm. Bertolt Brecht, along with Vonnegut, is like one of the great accusers of of literature and art. One of the great condemners of kind of society and sort of the ills of the world. But as I was saying to you in our correspondence, that he doesn't let himself off the hook. Same with Brecht. You know, Brecht, his famous poem saying, uh, "The Nazis burned books." but they didn't burn me, the bastards, you know? Like, mm-hmm. um, so it's like they're pointing the finger at kind of, you know, the, um, the evil of the world, but you also point the finger back at yourself. You know, you, um, uh, there's another quote we can talk about, but, you know, the, the theme of, of Brecht and also the theme of, in a way, Vonnegut and this whole question of being a survivor post-war existentialism is, you know, what did you do to survive? And you're what, but in a way, what does anyone do to survive in this world? In an evil world, um, how does one survive? How else can one survive except but by becoming a little bit evil yourself? And not just kind of like, you know, being famous, you know, making it normal everyday people, working people, just the workaday things. Yeah. Immigrants, that, you know, immigrants, have, all the fucking yeah. Russian immigrants in Brian Beach, they're all reactionaries, right? They're all like, you know, that's like also a cowardice. common the thing, idea right? Of cowardice too, yeah. if you think about it, to like that's that's a big thing. To, I mean, the, the theme of like cowardice and guilt is, is huge. It comes around again and again in Vonnegut, but uh, also Brecht and a lot of other post-war stuff too. Um, you know, um, it, it's very much the case. I mean, I mentioned to you the book, The Good Soldier, Soldier Schweik, Schweikianism. You know, mm-hmm. this is a big theme even in kind of an, other American sort of post-war sort of um, fiction. You know, Catch-22. What's the theme of Catch-22, right? You know, there are the planes, they go flying off. The pilots in them are going to their certain deaths. Um, how do you get out of that? <laughs> well, you pretend to be mad. Um, but the irony is, only a madman would go up in the planes to their certain death. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the kind of the theme of a lot of this work in Brecht, in, in, the, in the, the, Sch- the Schweik novel, but also kind of in Vonnegut's work here and there, kind of in Sort House Five and in Bluebeard, um, it's kind of the cowards that live to fight another day. Um, it's the, you know, in evolution, you know, it's not the, the, you know, might is right, kind of the strongest make it through. In a way, it's the cowards that, that run away with their tails between their legs. 
and and in a way like the the propinquity of cowardice to evil is you know is you know it is a, is a theme that that's raised in this novel and kind of you know is as a as a moral ethical sort of theme but it's it's interesting to think about and aesthetically too you know um like we say we don't really have a singular story of how abex came about or even of how any art movement you know historically how any art movement emerges and how this um we just have to kind of recombine it but um you know it, it it's it's it you know the abexes you know um, um you know we, we can think of them in a kind of heroic way we can think of them in a kind of a sort of an uncharitable kind of tabloid way you know kind of drinkers you know um uh, um macho kind of um uh, casual misogynists you know kind of like to, and, and it's like it's like how much are they one and the same and in what way it, uh, and which which um, do you know what i mean it's it's this kind of this slightly relativistic but also it, it really is the case that sometimes kind of um you know when things shift and when things sort of change there's this sort of moment kind of you know w w where sort of values in a way seem kind of all up in the air it's like do you know what i mean all these maneuvers and things that you have to do like we were saying to get by or in a way kind of this we're using the same kind of we're making we're using the same sort of things to make the same sort of judgments about art you know like uh, or, or anything else you know uh, what um what are the right choices you know like um, um what's you know what's best for you mm -hmm. really i mean taste in that way oh but i'm suddenly reminded you know, you were just reading your excerpt and I kind of laughed when Dan Gregory compared himself to Jesus. And I thought, there's one other person in the novel who compares himself to Jesus. Do you remember who it is? No, who is that? It's Cersei Berman, because she compares um, she compares Rabbi Karabekian to Lazarus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and says, I've raised you from the dead. Mm. Isn't that in interesting that like, uh, although Cersei Berman is a much more well-rounded what likable charitable per i mean in a way that's kind of what's important about her she's a kind person or, or like you know in a way she, well her kindness is also self-serving convenient for her own needs you know she she has a place to stay and so she kind of like she's like a latchkey sort of like friend who kind of lets herself in and sort of uh, malingers around but she is a, a positive force she introduces a much needed shall we say feminine element to Rabo's life and but in a way she suffers from kind of the same problem she suffers from a lot of the same problems that Rabo does and a lot of the same problems that um gregory does which yeah. is that in a way um she's she's um, um she, she's 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 locked up in herself yeah. and she's she's sort of um she's very much um she's taking it upon herself to kind of um uh, you know, because she's very much this sort of a very typical kind of American kind of, um, you know, she's telling everybody spit spot, get to work. And kind of, she's got this kind of Protestant work ethic, everyone has to be happy and smiley. They like, um, uh, it, it's kind of, it's, it's another way that she isn't, people have to behave the way that she wants, you know? Yeah. And, and, and you know, near the end, um, she has this, uh, you know, she, she definitely has, a character arc and that's you know uh, that's one of the good things about this book like everybody seems to have some sort of character arc you know to the extent that dan dan gregory is a, a, a character that um you know a reader would be somewhat repulsed by there's still mm. like any number of like sort of like redeeming qualities from his past or whatever stories that he shares about himself that oh yeah makes, you know makes you uh, view him in some other light and cc berman my you favorite know, she, character in the book probably dan gregory i think he's he's he's, fun, he's yeah. fun, just really readable so so like cc berman she's kind of like you know this uh sort of a hard ass in many ways but near the end um uh, what what does she say about herself it's something like uh she's a bit self-deprecating um, oh yeah so so this is basically what she says like yeah uh she kind she kind of comes clean about this part of herself that is locked up that is trying to mm -hmm. you know uh, also survive in the world and this is how she characterizes it she says uh at the end that's all i do write books mm -hmm. and dance as long as i keep that up i keep grief away 
One other thing mm. helps a little bit. It works for me. It probably wouldn't work for you. That's talking loud and brassy, telling everybody when they're right and wrong, giving orders to everybody, wake up, cheer up, get to work. I mean, I, I do the same thing on some level, right? Like I've sort mm. of trained myself to, you know, have an opinion on, on things that most people just sort of mm. like, you know, just like pass by, like, it, cause it's useful, right? It sort of situates you in the world. It situates you in well, it's, relation it's to, comp- to other confidence, people. But it's a confidence born out of insecurity. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, where, like, how much of that is true also with Bluebeard, Gregorian, you know, like, obviously yeah. he's a, you know, um, you yeah, know, all, all, all those name. stories, yeah, he's all, those, all of, those stories, he's exactly, ashamed. about himself, yeah, yeah. yeah. We also know that he's kind of ashamed of his heritage, kind of in a certain way, like, I'm a, uh, he, um, but then, uh, what, what else was I going to say? We, uh, she's, um, she's also, um, uh, she's also basically in self-imposed exile, isn't she? She's she's in her own way trying to she's trying to take over, kind of like um um uh well not take over actually, but she's she's moved in with Rabo. She's basically trying to like, hide off when no one knows her, but also mm-hmm. take over his house. You know, it's it it, it sounds you know yeah, <laughs> but yeah, there's also the, this sense that kind of she's kind of just as sort of at a distance from the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, while ironically she's selling all these best sellers we don't really know whether they're good or not i mean rabo's friend compliments them but but like apparently he's a he's a hack we all, all you know we don't know like i'm a uh <laughs> but mm-hmm. it, it's it it it's it, it's odd and you know i was talking to you as well kind of like apparently she does up the house in her in her decorations you know she puts in wallpaper and sort of these um rather morbid photographs of um sort of victorian children i believe and um you know the, just the just this it's so funny the, the the idea that this woman has like a taste of victorian kitsch but it but it kind of makes sense too kind of like i mean like who are these like best sellers who do really well in america especially at that time i mean like you had like i mean chris agatha christie always sold well in america but then yeah. so did I mean, Virginia Andrews, you know, VC Andrews, she was always like this very popular kind of like gothic novelist in a way or, or what have you. And it's like, I'm um, kind of, so, so she kind of represents kind of this kind of anachronistic sort of thing in her own yeah, way. I, I, I think that that aspect for aesthetics, right? She, she's into kitsch. Um, you know, it, it's interesting in, in its own right. There's this uh, uh, section on, on page 128, right? Yeah. Where so, you know, she moves into his house and she one day when he's gone, she replaces all the wallpaper with these like, you mm-hmm. know, like, or, or rather she replaces the paintings that that are up there, like all the abex stuff he's collecting with, yeah. uh, you know, these like kitschy, like uh, little girls or whatever. And um, I, I, I found this section interesting. So uh, uh, this is what she says. You don't call these pictures of little girls on swing serious art, jeered Mrs. Berman. Try thinking what the Victorians thought when they looked at them, which was how sick or unhappy so many of these happy, innocent little girls would be in just a little while. Diphtheria, pneumonia, smallpox, miscarriages, violent husbands, poverty, widowhood, prostitution, death and burial in Potter's field, right? So that's the way that she justifies and tries to sort of lend you know, the halo effect of like, you know, great art or like, you know, histories, whatever, uh, you know, justices to, you know, what is essentially just like bad wallpaper. Right. And the reason why it's interesting to me is this justification is a lot like the same kinds of explanations that I would often hear from people, uh, you know, that have historically, you know, perhaps like maybe not in art journals, but, you know, when you speak to people day to day, or if you talk to someone in the museum or whatever, that's the way that they would explain abstract expressionism, not exactly in the same terms, obviously, because these are just, you know, different things, but the strategy, right. That the tactic that she's using here, right. By referring to things really in some ways, kind of, you know, outside of what's going on, which is the narrative of the wallpaper, which is like little girls and swings, Oftentimes you could have an Abex painting and the narrative is literally black square. The narrative is literally red stripe. The narrative is whatever. And yet, you know, although, you know, people say, well, reflexively, you know, it, it's not anything beyond what it is. They do 
in their philosophical justifications, bring in all this stuff that is totally yeah. irrelevant to the art itself. So it's this, it's this nice kind of parallel. I'm not sure if, you know, Vonnegut was conscious when he was writing that, but um, immediately this is what I thought, like, wow, this is, you know, this is the, this is the, you know, realistic sort of, uh, you know, kitsch equivalent justification of the kinds of shit you would, you know, hear from like, uh, you know, I guess like ordinary people that are like, you know, trying to admire a Pollock or whatever. Um, well, what I would say is that like a kind of annoying thing that we get in museums, at least, is kind of like, well, I mean, what well, Cersei Berman kind of digs in their heels and defends it in the way that kind of like, you know, um, other people throughout the novel kind of like dig in their heels and sort of make a defense for kind of their view of art. And um, it's true that like sometimes with abstract art, there are these kind of, um, <laughs> you know, um, uh we have to we have to have kind of well, well actually more for recent um abstract artists in a way like but in in a, in a sense kind of the abexes are kind of such celebrity artists by now their mythology is so ubiquitous that it's it's um, um it's almost kind of part of the whole um glamour of it it's kind of it's part of the package but we do get, you know, war labels that kind of unhelpfully, you know, tell you kind of you know, just regurgitate a whole bunch of cliches at you that kind of, you know, like I was saying, kind of you're expected to accept completely uncritically and all, all at once. Um, you know, uh, for instance, you know, like, um, I mean, if I mean, if abstract art is supposed to be um, non-objective, you know, not have a fixed sort of meaning, then why do I need to have some kind of speech about kind of blah 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 or you know why, why are you talking to me about something that isn't about you know um uh, you know, formalist kind of like stuff like you know but but again that's kind of an alienating technical stuff anyway so like you wouldn't really kind of you know you can't imagine like uh some sort of the tate gallery kind of filling brochures with stuff about um you know uh um you know gesture and um and you know, duration and sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, relief or something like that, you, what you would have would be a kind of a, a sort of almost a, a tabloid kind of version, a kind of a, a mm. broad kind of a, a th this, is, this is the kind of the stuff that one that gets annoyed with, kind of the, there's all sorts of bad writing and bad talk about art that goes on of all kinds, um, yeah. not just the abexes, but god the quattrocento the renaissance just like an, like uh, uh, people who you know write all kinds of guff and we're supposed to just accept it but that's a problem not just with it's it is a, a larger social problem as well as an in, individually institutional problems you know like uh, um the fact that like everything is everything is being run by curators and gallerists and people who are all connected and all have stuff they want to publish and all that kind of stuff because i mean that's what their education is for you learn about all this stuff that's the thing about art history i mean when you amass all this knowledge what do you do with it um most of the time people write these horrible introductory books for art amateurs that are actually totally shit and totally unhelpful but people buy them because they're curious and they want to know about art and so they'll eat up anything you say like yeah, the art talk stuff is sort of um it's it's this it's this thing that happens like and and like it's the, in a way it's the hardest part of art to kind of pick through all, all the kind of dross i would mm. say though that kind of like the way that vonnegut just present this thing is that you know it, it's not so much you know, it's that you know it's not a bad thing for people to stand up and defend art and kind of say kind of no you're looking at it wrong or kind of like you're you know they're, they're, you're like, i disagree but you know the way she defends the art that she hangs up is um you know she says think about how victorians would look at this it's like all right but we're not victorian this isn't a vic you know what i mean like this this the diary like we're not victorians um those you know hopefully um the little children we see in the street tomorrow aren't going to die of tb or um get stuffed up a well or you know um get raped to death by you know some chaplain in a workhouse hopefully mm -hmm. <laughs> um you know like we don't live in that world but this is just the, the problem i mean like um it's this kind of kind of artificial it's a sentimental 
very kind of uh, repressed kind of way of looking at kind of art, you know, kind of kind of Christian. I mean, for God's sake, uh, the Victorians, like they had some really beastly kind of um, um, sort of contradictory values, you know, very sort of, you know, Church of England, but uh, like a very um, prudish, priggish society, but also awfully cruel, sort of despicable things could happen day to day that no one would talk about because it simply wasn't English, you know, and you know, and for her to like point to this art, which in a way represents sort of the deep evil and hypocrisy of kind of like Victorian society that people would hang up little babies in their halls and kind of go, oh, you know, like to be young, oh, it's to be, mm. you know, some sort of bullshit quoting Wordsworth, while meanwhile kind of like, you know, children were being like literally sort of like, um, uh, you know, thrown out of windows and sort of like uh, and if they were bastards you know put in workhouses you know just this horrible and equal society it's kind of funny it's funny that and also horrifying if we think about i mean the whole scene is is a comedy sort of is a bit of a farce you know with like him coming home and the house has been redecorated on the surface it's a farce you know what have you done and his eye patch falls off but there's a kind of horror to the whole scene where kind of all the people in the household side with her they side mm-hmm. with her against Rabo and they go, yeah, all your, all your high ideas about art. I'm sorry. You know, they, they're almost accusing him. They say, when I look at that art, I feel something. It's like, yeah, but you feel, it's just sentiment. It's nothing, you know, they, they're kind of like, oh, I look at that painting of the black girl kind of walking like, the, you know, obviously that's very clearly modeled off of the very famous painting by, um, what, what's his name? Um, Norman Rockwell you know, who um, did the sort of painting of the black girl going to school kind mm-hmm. of while being taunted by um, a segregationist. But like, but like, so she said, oh, I really like that painting or whatever. And well, the, 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 well, the, 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 the painting, the painting, uh, the Rabo does, um, it's... Uh, well, the pa- well, the painting that Dan Gregory. Oh, yeah, Dan so, like, Gregory. Like, they, it, they talk it, about, like, I love that one. And yeah. then a Rabo says, like, <laughs> he would never even let a black person in his house, you know? But, like, but, but like, I, I was I was actually curious about the painting. I was wondering, like, how would that actually, how would it look like? Because the way that it was described, it was more interesting than the Norman Rockwell of, like, you know, being taunted as you're as you're going, you know, to school, or whatever. That that's kind of like yeah, you know, perhaps. it's ha- it's it's ham fisted. But the way that that this painting is described was something like, uh, two you know, a bunch of kids or like two kids come together, and uh, they seem to be from different neighborhoods, and they're not certain whether or not they should be interacting. Like I feel like there's much more of a subtlety there, right? There's much more room for poetry. You know, as opposed to a kind of, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, look, the Norman Rockwell thing would be kind of kitschy. You know, I know that's like an aesthetic thing, but like well, beyond think, being think, kitschy, I but think, it could also be kind of trite, I think. I, I take your point, but I'm, uh, maybe I'm misremembering this, but there was also, wasn't she also saying one of the characters kind of, I like that painting because I wonder what's going to happen next or something like this. Yeah, it might, yeah, it might be a silly, way, yeah, silly way of characterize then. Yeah, but, um, but still, in, like, the painting way, itself might be interesting from the way it was described, at least. I think this is a good opportunity as well to sort of get to another big theme of the book, which is the kind of way in which the role of the painter or roles of the painter, I kind of pitted against the roles of the author, where especially with this idea about the storytelling, right? Where kind of Rabo kind of fascinatingly um, sort of, you know, in a way he kind of separates it. He kind of thinks, you know, it's, it's wrong. His contention is it's wrong to tell stories and art. Um, just because kind of like, you know, kind of overall, he says kind of, you know, the amount of people who kind of believe that they're kind of in the right and they're kind of like they're, um, um, they're ever so virtuous and they're kind of, um, um, they're saying the right thing. It never dates and it kind of, uh, you can in a way be sanctioning um, without intending to some pretty evil stuff, you know, um, just, you know, just by telling stories. I mean, and in a way that's interesting because what is Vonnegut but a storyteller? And you know, all those lectures he talks about storytelling, and but people always miss the tongue in cheek element of to it. Well, like, in a way, Vonnegut really does believe this in the sense where he thinks, kind of like, if you're going to tell a story, like you know, you know, you really should kind of think about what you're saying. You know, like, like uh, there is kind of um, you like um, uh, there, you know, even if you don't mean to, um. And that, that, that's, you know, that's, way, uh, that, that's her mm-hmm. aesthetic, right? That's Berman's aesthetic as well. She was like, you know, yeah. if you could, you know, if you have a dictionary, you know how to write a complete sentence, 
uh, why is it hard to write unless you have nothing to say, right? Isn't that the difficulty? That's the way that she presents mm. it, right? That's like a simplification of what writing is, but still there is something to that idea, I think. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, in the way there's, there's something to, to both the way they say, but like you, you, can, you can see both of where they're coming from. I, I think, um, but, you know, um, I think the, what, what does he say as well that's interesting? Because there's Robert Karabekin's um, ab abstract paintings, which are kind of process paintings that he does with the tape. But he says, he says that in his heart of heart, hearts, he's, a, he's still a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And kind of in a way, he kind of still has this need to tell stories, but kind of he doesn't trust himself to tell the right ones or that kind of because in a way he doesn't trust himself. Kind of again, he mm -hmm. feels all this shame. Did I do the right thing? Am I a good person? Even yes. am I am I a good person? Just someone who would like to believe he's a good person like Dan Gregory. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what happens if I'm, if I'm not? So he doesn't trust himself to tell the stories, but he does want to. And, and he feels conflict. What's the right story? to tell? And in a way, that last painting he does. It, he finally finds the one thing he wants to say the one you know what happens next he feels is really matters and then anyway after that and like we were saying earlier kind of he said everything you know mm -hmm. he doesn't do more that's it and like in a way kind of you know if, if only some artists <laughs> did the same but um uh it, it, it it's very it's very much the case that he provide he says that he deliberately kind of privately misreads his own abstract paintings isn't he kind of he almost like takes pleasure in what he feels is like this vulgar mm -hmm. way of looking at the paintings which is that that red stripe stands for you know x that stripe stands for you know i don't know a polar bear and you know, and this stands for you know the tundra uh, so so and and in a way kind of like he kind of he allows us to kind of um, um to sort of to see kind of you know, in a, in a way, he talks about that much more than formalism. In a way, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't spend pay, like a, a long time talking about, you know, brush strokes or what have you. Like, um, but he he kind of, in a way, much more focuses on this that idea of misreading or betraying the art, even mm -hmm. betraying your own art. Think about that. You know, like how can one betray your own art, your own intentions? And that this is again, these are the kind of themes we get sometimes in Brecht and certainly all the times of Vonnegut. And I think this is really interesting and really revealing in a way. And, and kind of like certainly was an education for me. To are, are, are you basically saying that that's not like that's not really possible, or you're casting doubt on it, or what are you trying to say? No, I think it's perfectly, it's, it's perfectly yeah, valid. Yeah, I agree. It's I agree. Thing to do. Uh, I think, and, and it's, and in a way, it's kind of again, like I think the right way to write about kind of, you know, for a writer to approach kind of stuff you know Vonnegut doesn't you know, he, you know he's he will always be a storyteller but he you know, he 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 you know he's not gonna um, like he has a very certain kind of story he wants to tell and for him it's very important that he tells it but you know he 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 you know like he provides you opportunities to misread him just as in a way Robert Karabekian kind of like in a way kind of revels in this sort of idea that like there's this sort of private reading that's only for him, which kind of contradicts kind of the way we read him in um, Breakfast of Champions, or well, doesn't necessarily contradict, but he kind of like, he kind of like sits up and um, uh, sort of um, in a way kind of talks back and says kind of like, um, well, we, again, we don't know whether we don't, it, it's difficult to say exactly kind of how that Rabo squares with this one, but um, you know, he kind of defiantly tells people kind of like, you know, look, you just, all you guys see is surface you, you you don't you know for you it's all about money or whatever and like you have this this i this idea of me but like but like but in a way he just makes the case for his own sin sincerity about the mm. art and also like um uh, in a way he's kind of he's kind of contempt for the audience which i think carries over here kind of like he uh, well obviously i don't think vonnegut has contempt for his audience but i think rabo he, he allows to have a bit of contempt for the idea of a, of a of a mass public a general public. because um but you know in a way that kind of vonnegut can never quite do i mean like that's like we were saying i mean like how how is vonnegut going to write a novel which you know has like you know embodies like the values of a, of a barnett newman page it, it can't you know like he, and it would in a way it would be completely wrong i mean it's 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 like that it's more close to that ad reinhardt thing you know like the, those cartoons that he draws where it's almost it's like um uh, 
it's like it's like um it's it's very tongue in cheek and it's make me schizophrenic you know like the idea of the guy pointing at the painting and the painting pointing back well why do we need this cartoon by ad reinhardt to tell us this you know well i i, I also but, think that's, that's like, a, like specifically but, on that cartoon like um yeah. like like if you think about it like uh you know the, the the thing that strikes me about that whole uh you know pointing the finger like what does this mean and then pointing mm. back well what you know what do you mean what do you represent mm. Um, I think, uh, the reason why it might work, you know, as a, let's just call it like a polemic, right. For the sake of argument, the reason why it might work as a polemic, uh, for many people is because, uh, most people probably are not able to answer that question. What do you represent? Most people don't have any kind of representation. They don't necessarily have a, a deeper purpose, but you know, um, if you're or the if idea you're, that we represent that we, if we could, to the degree that we could represent something that we could represent one thing, essentially. You know, well, or, or it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Have, it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, essentially, it doesn't even have to be like one thing. But uh, I, you know, I think when I live, I represent a, a specific kind of purpose. I try to live that purpose. I try to surround myself with objects and with ideas and with whatever that I can to sort of live that out. But I, I don't think many people can. I don't think the majority of people that are reviewing art. That are you know poking fun of either you know whether it's kitsch or whether it's abex or whether it's you know whatever yeah. it doesn't matter what it is i don't think they're able to answer that question for themselves right um which is why it works as a polemic but i'm not so sure it would work as an argument if the audience is you know uh, a, a group of people that really have thought about it and that really do try to live out some kind of purpose you know what i mean so th th that's why that part of the cartoon rubs me a little bit the wrong way you know, it, it's nice as a polemic, but beyond that, you know, would it really work with a certain kind of audience? You know what I mean? Well, well, the the I well, 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 well no, well, I I think the polemic of that really is kind of in abstract art. The idea is that there's no difference between an artwork's appearance and you know what it does. Mm -hmm. So kind of like the and the idea is that you know we don't believe that people should represent things literally. In the sense that the what you know what they represent is any different from what they do for it. I mean, what's that phrase that people say sometimes? Kind of like I'm, uh, um, you know, uh, <laughs> like sort of jokingly people say, "Do, um, do as I say, not as I do." And we mm -hmm. go, like, "Hang on, isn't that a bit hypocritical?" Well, this the whole hypocrisy is a, one of the big themes of kind of um, um, sort of the book um, Bluebeard, but also kind of like of art criticism around sort of abstract art. I mean. Um, when um, in Ad Reinhardt's cartoon, when the train comes on to run that little girl down on the train tracks, uh, the, uh, that the train is labelled money grubbing hypocrisy. You know, like it, pe people, you know, um, all these are kind of interesting, fascinating ideas, right? But why? Like, and and you, they bring us to kind of, um, you know, they can bring us to different conclusions, right? But that little cartoon and all the kind of these ideas it brings up from Ad Reinhardt. Um, Again, the point is, why do we need that in a cartoon? Can't we just get that from the painting? If we can, do you know what I mean? Like, if, like, the point is, the painting needs to speak for itself, or should speak for itself, or kind of has a kind of autonomy, you know, seemingly. But we have this cartoon. Yeah, you know, we can't have that cartoon in the painting, you know, in a way, or else it would cease to be what we would call kind of classically abstract, or whatever. So the whole contradiction and the sort of the weird self awareness, in a way, the self defeating self awareness. We were talking about artists who, in a way, kind of introduce things that kind of disturb what we would say would think would be their intentions. This is kind of something that is there in Reinhardt, and in a way, has to be there in the abstract art. Kind of, although again, like we might be ready to accept it, maybe more. It might make more sense to us to either accept it as something entirely kind of you know, you know, uh, mouth breathingly kind of serious or what have you. But but I think you know. All, all this is there kind of in, in, in Bluebird, Beard, certainly, this kind of ironic, deconstructive, postmodern, shall we even say, already postmodern kind of idea about, you know, what does abstraction really mean? You know, you know, like, uh, like, you know, it's, it's the sympathy towards the abstract art that the abexes represent, but it's also a kind of a certain kind of, you know, is, is this the kind of, you know, is it a, can it be something else other than this? Is like because it kind of looks a bit like a dead end, too. You know, if it, if if you know, um, um, if all the painters are dead and sort of Rabbi Karabekian is in his mausoleum of a house with all these sort of serious tomb-like serious paintings, 
you know, like I'm a yeah, he really calls abstract? himself a museum guard. So yeah, is this? Yeah. I mean, like, in what way does this really represent kind of abstract values or, or, or not? Or, you know what? Do you know what I mean? Like, is you know, is um, so it you know, it's this um, um it's a probing, deconstructive kind of thing too. That's always that's already there. Uh, which i which i like as well so it's like we were saying like in it's this isn't just some sort of celebration of kind of a certain kind of art or like a trial pitting one art against another it, it really is kind of like you know you know in a way getting to these deeper questions of you know why make art at all you know i was watching the red shoes by um, a pole and pressburger the other day you know, mm-hmm. a wonderful film yeah, you know, it begins with Lermontov speaking to the the ingenue, the sort of you know, the, the young dancer. He says, "Why do you want to dance?" She says, "Why do you want to live?" And he says, mm-hmm. "I don't know. Um, there's not no reason really. I just have to." And you know, I, th- I think, it, like, like I said, sort of at, at the at the bottom of it, kind of like it, our need to survive is very much also linked to kind of the, what the need we feel to make art. The, the sense we have, our sophisticated senses that we have of being in the world, of gauging our environment, are a survival mechanism. Um, we have the sophisticated hum- hearing that we have as um, you know, Homo sapiens um, because over the years we've evolved from you know, the fish with legs that we used to be to the sophisticated creatures we are now. You know, uh, by kind of um, gauging our environment and sort of seeing, you know, so we're like cavemen around a fire, so we can listen out for saber two tigers that be creeping up behind us. But we also use our sense of hearing to enjoy the lovely, lovely sound of music. You know, um, uh, my sense of space, my spatial orientation, how far away things are from me or how far away things are from one another um, is also a survival mechanism. If my house caught on fire and I needed to run out really quickly without crashing into everything, you know, that's summer. But at the same time, I also use that to, uh, um, you know, I also appreciate architecture and um, um, uh, paintings and what have you. Um, so so and they're both the same thing one is the basic survival level and the other is a much more elaborate thing that goes into culture but it's the same mechanism altogether uh, our sense of being in the world you know we we um it's very much connect we we need to take delight in our sense of being in the world you know we need to be able to enjoy our senses or else like just existence would be torture you know like we like we have to find some kind of way uh, and it's not logical but it all and and things shift all the time and so so i think kind of it's while kind of it's it's very moving to say i need art like i need love kind of like because because they're both connected deep down at the bottom of things with being human it's there's also an another side to that coin where kind of you know liking art can also be just as like um, um fraught and just as, in a way, um, uh, shall we say, uh, disorienting, disorientating as 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 like actual existence, reality can be. Um, it, it, it's uh, um, it, it can be alienating too. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but both both, uh, and that you know, for better and worse, you know, it's just it's just the fact of our of our reality, and. But again, like uh, this, this is just it. Like uh, it, this part of the whole sophisticated vernacular of the, of, of the, this text. I mean, um, uh, like the, if there's one painter that Robert Karabikin seems to resemble the most in the book, it would be Barnett Newman, and um, uh, you know Barnett Newman's zip or stripe paintings. You know the vertical lines running down the, the fields of mostly flat color. And you know those paintings, in a way, are in of themselves um, kind of. Donald Judd says about sort of field paintings, they are at one on the at all at once, um, absolutely flat, but also infinitely spatial. You know, as if they're segments cut out of some kind of you know you know just infinite sort of thing. Some so, so much more as if the painting moves out from its confines it al- already in sort of in some some abstract art there is this kind of neither neither kind of thing where 
the, the painting is different things in, in well, I, I, I don't know, but the painting is almost on its way to being something else or kind of sort of seems to sort of, seems to sort of, um, um, seems to be sort of an object and a painting. It seems to be, um, it seems to be travestying a certain kind of beauty while actually being in a way quite beautiful kind of paintings in their own right. You know, if, if we feel so inclined to kind of look for the beauty where it's there, but you know, this, this is just it, you know, kind of like, um, ab abstract art can have its own kind of humor to it, shall we say? Cause I think there is humor in, in abstract art that we aren't willing to see sometimes it can be a mocking humor, um, certainly we get some of that in de Kooning and, and Jackson Pollock, but I think, and even like in 1910s abstract painters like Molievich, you know, who are again, very high minded, self-serious ideologues, you know, kind of, they have all these ideas about society and fate even, but they're also human beings who have, you know, sex lives and, um, if you were, um, are trying to pay the, the rent day to day. Uh, and, and no one's necessarily asking them to do this, especially not when they start out. So, you know, it, it's kind of like on the, I mean, w one of the best things I ever heard someone say about a Jackson Pollock painting was that it's all at once. What makes Jackson Pollock great is that all at once, it looks like the music of the spheres and like a dog pissing against the wall. Now, is it the case that it has to be one or the either? Or, I mean, can it be both at the same time? But in a way, this is the, what I like about Jackson Pollock and you know like the fact that on the one hand it's like it, it, it's quite you know um it, it it risks a certain kind of like bad taste while at the same time being like almost exquisitely tasteful you know like contradiction like it's already I think that the that Vonnegut is kind of circling around this I mean in a way he kind of literalizes it and, and sort of makes literary this kind of slightly paradoxical quality of of, of abstract art in, in by you know by of course kind of saying kind of like well we can just look at it as if it were a kind of reduced minimum a figurative painting the stripes of people the the field is the environment or that kind of and often they're quite funny situations that he describes you know that stripe is an eskimo that stripe is a is a polar bear or something like that but like you know i think there was a critic i read um once who sort of said sort of the interesting thing i think it may have even been um oh i'm not sure i'm uh, but i think someone like kenneth kenneth clark um, um so kind of a popular tv critic but but he said kind of the thing that was sort of great and unsettling about abex was that on the one hand it's incredibly high-minded but also reflects a kind of the vulgarity of american culture you know like, how can it be both? Yet it is. So, you know, in, and if we think about it, kind of what's, what's Vonnegut? Kind of like, um, um, you know, but sort of that, kind of like this person who does want to be, a bit like Brecht, very high-minded, but also um, welcomes a sort of mass audience. He sort of welcomed, like, um, uh, I mean, Brecht dreamt about sort of music halls where the working class could come in and sort of smoke their cigarettes and watch, you know, real life dramas play out without artificial conflict that would reflect their actual experiences and what have you. And, um, uh, but so, so this sort of weird mixture of sort of, you know, um, uh, um, you know, um, sort of a high minded way of thinking about art mixed with a, a certain kind of um, vaudevillian sort of tendency as it were you know kind of like that there, there is something kind of almost campy about the abexes you know are they being frivolous are they being serious you know uh in a way at the end of the day we're led to believe that they're very serious especially nowadays the curators will say no 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 the abexes were very serious people um they they had turbulent lives they were all addicted to alcohol so so and so and, and they were but you know, again, this is just the, the it's the case that with most criticism, where it led to sort of pick A or B or C or D or what have you, so that we can compartmentalize, and mainly so that we can it can continue to be sold as a commodity.
you know, so that we have like the, the selling point and the, you know, and it, it distributes properly. I mean, but you know, this, this is, this is just the thing. I mean, like uh, if you're a critic and you attempt to frustrate the commodification of a certain kind of art, then, you know, people just don't want to talk to you. Uh, but I think Vonnegut is very much like keenly aware of this. Like he, he's coming from the same thing. And in the novel, um, Cersei Berman kind of reflect in, in a way represents kind of, a kind of certain vulgar American culture, broad, populist, um, kitschy, chipper, peppy, um, but also quite conservative, backward looking, kind of Tory. Like in a way, like Edwardian England was kind of had this artificial kind of um, Victoriana all the time. She's this kind of best selling author, but she's, um, um, and you know, she writes books that are like sell, for, sell by the millions to like teenage girls or whatever. Um, uh, but but um but what i mean but what does she actually yeah in the way what does that abstract painting say in the advert what does she represent you know like i'm um, uh, like what does she actually you know you know we, we um what there's that mo novel that yeah i mean I, I i i i think the point is that that question could also be posed in the same exact terms right and oftentimes with the same exact answers mm. um you know to abex painters right i mean mm. That's 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 kind of the the, the thing, right? Like, do, do you want to talk she, about? She like, represents like... a contradiction, though. That's the point. She represents a kind of contradiction in, in uh, like, uh, but that's the same as yeah, as is Vonnegut. As is Vonnegut's defenses, you know, uh, of mm. Abex, you know, to the, whatever degree that they exist within this book, right? I mean, there, there's this uneasy, you know, alliance that he has, right? To to the extent that he views himself, you know, also as playful, right? Um, there's also this, like, so like. When so Rainbow Carabakian is also a character, a minor character in um, Breakfast of Champions, right. and uh, in in this book uh, he also uh, you know paints uh, you know a, a piece of abex that I want to um, show here. Uh, it's it's called the Temptation of Saint Anthony, and I and I think like kind of like how it's used in this book is is very uh, telling in different ways. So let me just uh, show this here. So this is the Temptation of Saint Anthony. Uh, for viewers that don't know, this is actually a pretty common motif uh, throughout uh, art, right? So like you know we we have this. You know, going back, you know, many, many centuries, uh, uh, of course. And this mm. is so look. First of all, I, it's all, I, 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 it's I also find a it kind of reference to it's a reference to um, uh, Barnett Newman, who would always um, rather ostentatiously name his sort of paintings after sort of you know he would like crucifixion or deposition or stuff like that. You know, um, yeah. I, I, yeah. And uh, I, I think it's kind of like funny that first of all, the the image file here that they used to represent uh, this painting is an SVG, which is, you know, it's like a vector image, which can only be done with extremely simple colors. Uh, so like, first of all, there's mm -hmm. like that little, that little piece that this is the way that technologically would be represented, you know, after the, you know, this is, book is written decades ago. Anyway, so uh, Karabakian, he uh, he appears in Breakfast of Champions, and the uh, the role he plays there is uh, so. There's like this like si uh, I forget what city the name of the city that they're all in. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, it's it's the Midland City Arts Festival. So all these people are invited, yeah. and a bunch of people are upset at the fact that uh, the city has purchased for I, I forget what the price mm -hmm. is this painting right yeah. for itself yeah. and um so a, a bunch of people are upset one critic you know decides to, like shit, shit all over this painting so uh Rabel Karabakian he stands up and he starts to defend this painting and I find that the the, the the defense very compelling but the irony to me is that the the the, the, the power of the defense comes from in a sense like everything that that this painting is not so let me just like read his defense of it so he stands up uh after he after someone says like i've seen better pictures done by a five-year-old so he stands up and this is the way that he defends it the painting did not exist until i made it karabakian went on now that it does exist nothing would make me happier than to have it reproduced again and again and vastly improved upon by all the five-year-olds in town. 
I would love for your children to find pleasantly and playfully what it took me many angry years to find. I now give you my word of honor, he went on, that the picture your city owns shows everything about life which truly matters with nothing left out. It is a picture of the awareness of every animal. It is the immaterial core of every animal, the I am to which all messages are sent. It is all that is alive in any of us, in a mouse, in a deer, in a cocktail waitress. It is unwavering and pure, no matter what preposterous adventure may befall us. A sacred picture of St. Anthony alone is one vertical, unwavering band of light. If a cockroach were near him or a cocktail waitress, the picture would show two such bands of light. Our awareness is all that is alive and may be sacred in any of us. Everything else about us is dead machinery. I have just heard from this cocktail waitress here, this vertical band of light, a story about her husband and an idiot who was about to be executed at Shepherdstown. Very well. Let a five-year-old paint a sacred interpretation of that encounter. Let that five-year-old strip away the idiocy, the bars, the waiting electric chair, the uniform of the guard, the gun of the guard, the bones and meat of the guard. What is that perfect picture which any five-year-old can paint? Two unwavering bands of light. Mm -hmm. Ecstasy bloomed on the barbaric face of Rabo Karabakian. Citizens of Midland City, I salute you, he said. You have given a home to a masterpiece. Now, the reason why I find this compelling is, I mean, it's extremely well written. Later on in the book, uh, as you know, uh, one of the character goes uh, characters goes crazy. He sees other people as it's quoted as unwavering bands of light. Now, mm. the reason why you know this painting is of any kind of interest to me at all is because not not because it's this you know abstract expressionist painting that I could look at whenever I want and I see you know some avocado green and a band of orange. Uh, it is also it is it is more so the fact that this is the way that it's been described. This is the way that it's been put to use in a way that is decidedly non abex. It's been put to a use that has a very clear narrative, a narrative that is extremely well wrought, a narrative that is not merely you know, a vertical line against avocado green, right? It is in so many ways, like it, it has the playfulness of Abex, even this passage does, but it has a narrative heft that the narrative of one band of light against green would not have, right? Without this additional description. And so much even, you know, uh, of this book and also uh, of Bluebeard, right? So much of the power of some of the descriptions of Abex comes from, the narrative force of a guy who sits down to write and says, I'm going to meticulously craft my prose. I'm going to give it a, a, the kind of meaning that Cersei Berman might be okay with adjudicating, right, for herself as well as, um, you know, for the poor of society. I will not merely allow, you know, this, this pure abstraction to speak for itself. I can't, right? text requires something meaningful you can't just you know sit at a typewriter or you know at a word processor and just randomly put some you know string together letters or you know or even have like a book that is nothing but you know beautiful image after beautiful image that doesn't go anywhere right so the irony that i find in, in this you know very compelling defense of this painting it, it, it comes from a textual narrative that is impossible to be taken at face value in any kind of abex, right? Compared to like, you know, like this is this is a I think this is an excellent painting by uh Cezanne, right? This is also Temptation of, of St. Anthony. When you compare this to um the way that this was treated in the past, like I think this is much more compelling, right? Um, so uh anyway, the, uh, th these are some of the ironies that you know not only exist in Bluebeard, but also float in and out of. Uh, uh, his, his other texts, right? So I'm not sure if you have, uh, you know, any input on that, but I, I do find it a very kind of interesting kind of irony. Like his playfulness is there, right? He he could take that from Abex and he could sort of claim ownership of it. But the only reason why it works for Vonnegut is 
He has a narrative that on its face is like the narrative that we see here in the Cezanne painting. It's not like, like, like th 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 this book has much less in common with this painting than it does with this painting. That's true of Bluebeard. That's true of uh, Breakfast of Champions. Sorry, th sorry. The Bluebeard has more in common with the Cezanne than it does with Barton and Newman is what you're saying. Um. It, it it had yeah it had same thing with any Vonnegut novel I think you know almost by definition. What do, what does um or, or rather but what does um. Well the the, the, the well, well the, I would I would the, the, the fact the fact the fact that the narrative is there. Well, I mean, you asked well, me a I question. Would, I would say to you, <laughs> I would say all right, but I would say to you, like, what's the connection then between maybe not Barnett Newman then between that green painting that you were showing and then the Cezanne. You know, well, um, you know, other than the title, you know, they both other, have well, a, they both have a narrative and a title, essentially, and colors. Well, apart from <laughs> the fact they have the same title, but um, is that the only thing? Going, I mean, obviously, one is it's not actually a real painting, but but more or less, um, why not? Why not? Well, once once not an actual physical sense object in the world and isn't made with paint, so it's a, but definitionally, it's not really a painting. I mean, painting can mean all kinds of things. But, okay. Yeah, yeah, but, but right, that's, that's because it's right. an SVG. Do, do, you wanna, but... do you wanna sit down? Yeah, but do you wanna sit, do you wanna have a conversation where we sit down and like talk about what is painting, okay? But like, painting is something done with paint, okay? But, but please bear with me. I'm just saying that like, okay. more or less, what we think of Rabo, you know, when we imagine and when Rabo's paintings are described to us, they're Barnett Newman paintings. Um, you know, that's, they're, they're big, you know, paintings made kind of mainly with monochrome with zips. And you know, I, I kind of see the point you're you're setting up here, and and like, but I, I you know, I, I think really the thing is, uh, I mean, like, for instance, a lot of the work we get, a lot of the work in or or around kind of New, Newman's paintings. Um, did I say Rothko? I'm getting a bit confused now. Sorry, but did I say New Barnett Newman's paintings are conceptual, but we can only really get to those concepts through the object. I mean, kind of like in a way, that's that's just the thing. I mean, um, uh, the thoughts that we derive from the world and the sense objects that made them make them up. I mean, uh, why 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 compartmentalize them? I mean, this this is the whole thing point with Vonnegut here that he's trying to kind of expose and confuse and deliberately misapply kind of the wrong kind of way of reading to different things i mean like is this really like the best defense of the painting kind of like to stand up and go okay think about you know that zip as that or that as that especially when i mean it works in the context of the novel because lyrically too because yeah a theme is that where we see people as almost like vertical things vials filled with you know antibodies or whatever or else as beams of light so it's it's a nice light motif in the novel but I mean, the whole point, I mean, what I think is more important within kind of his big speech to say like, you know, listen, I mean, like um, you say that like, it could have been done by a five-year-old, but like that kind of single-mindedness, that like that effortless single-mindedness that you get is something I've taken years to perfect, you know, and like, uh, and, and also the fact that kind of, it's about orientation, right? Kind of like, um you're supposed to think about the stripes in relation to your body you know um uh the 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 actual um boundary of the work becomes its most significant feature in a sense it has autonomy but it's supposed to you know it in a way like those paintings in the cartoon by ad reinhardt it's pointing back at you you know it's it's a uh, painting kind of becomes something else too as well as just a window onto another world where a story is happening you're part of the painting story um and you know this is a kind of a, a weird thing to think about and a silly thing to think about but it's there too i mean uh, we, we've talked we mentioned like wallpaper you know and, and, yeah, i think another kind of common criticism one gets for kind of abstract art is you know um what's the risk you know isn't it a bit like wallpaper but mm -hmm. Mightn't we think a bit more about wallpaper? You know, it's certainly possible to admire wallpaper. I mean, um, but you know, the color structures and abstract paintings aren't so extendable as wallpaper. And you know, they come in rolls with repeated patterns. And, you know, it's it's that it's that urgent sense of a whole 
in particular, the framing, uh, which which never comes into it. I mean, uh, uh, an abstract painting um, where, where things have to be harmonized um, and, and there has to be some kind of dynamic, active relationship. I mean, this is the same for Mondrian and Barnett Newman. I mean, that formality, you know, um, is connected to reality. It's not that kind of, um, okay, um, either... Um, either kind of the, the work represents the real or it doesn't. Um, because it, it's very much the case that realism as it began in sort of both literary movements and sort of not modernism, but in painting too, didn't just mean, um, uh, how, sh how should we say, um, a kind of de-sophisticated, just looking at reality. Because okay, in a way, in cinema and literature, that's kind of what it meant, meant de-sophisticating things. And certainly in sort of Nazi Germany and Russia, that's kind of what they wanted to do away with. They kind of, the, a, a highfalutin, fucking sophisticated way of looking at, you know, like, a, but the real is the world of sort of sensuosity as well as kind of, you know, um, the specific or, or what we would, you know, or the abject you know it's it's some um like the paint th those sort of big, if they were real paintings and in a way they don't even need to be because the way they're described in the novel are just so close to barnett newman's paintings you know if you really want to go see a rabbit cover wrecking one just go see them but it really is the case that kind of like we can't have all this fucking stupid like you know um talk 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 about the art without those paintings you know and although it might feel that you know like uh, it, it can conversate the talk can stem off and go in its own direction and whatever uh or, or have a certain kind of limit you know uh, it, it's it, it's still very much case that art isn't something apart from the real world and that kind of and that kind of the the contradiction you know when when people kind of you know the whole joke of kind of about art is kind of like people looking at uh, sort of um, in those cartoons in the New Yorker and sort of the, the last century kind of like people looking at splatters going, "Is that me? Am I that? Is my life? You know, you know, because uh, it's that kind of philistine thing. It's like, um, oh, well, yeah, but what does it represent? Like, is that what life is? You know, but what if it is? You know, like what what if abstract values are actually more real and more you than you would even realize? you know and maybe it's not kind of something so um in a way i will say kind of literal as kind of you are a splatter or you are a stripe but it is that case that kind of like like i'm a, um like uh how, how to kind of nip off this thought because <laughs> I've, I've said I've, I've already said yeah. it basically it's that it's that the you know the um, in that in that greenbergian sense kind of a um it's not that it's uh, that there, there, there's there's so much more to connect to and think about and to feel um uh, and ra uh, and you know i i kind of i kind of like i kind of like how rabbi karabekin on on the one hand kind of in that book seems to in a way kind of it would kind of be like basically kind of agreeing with people as he disagrees with them, you know, in mm -hmm. that whole, in that moment, he's saying, uh, okay, yeah, your five-year-old can do it. But like that, that would only be because really I had spent all that work doing it. And like, so it's yes. And it's not no, but it's like, I'm a yes. Okay. It's just a big stripe on the painting, but like, I'm a, it, like, you know, it's like, I'm a, you know, but, but like, I, I think the most consequential, but in all in that entire equation is Vonnegut's writing, it's Vonnegut's description, it's Vonnegut's narrative, right? As opposed to mm. the face value narrative of, you know, avocado, green, orange stripe, right? Both of those are narratives. That's kind of like what I was trying to argue, you know, early on, both of those are narratives, but the the most substantive of the two it comes from Vonnegut himself like that painting cannot stand on its own like you even you know went as far as saying that's not a real painting but you know it's real in the sense that someone had instructions right in breakfast of champions of in terms of what that painting is and some guy decided to make a vector image of it i mean you know like it's it, it has reality in that sense right uh mm. Yeah, but and and also, but we also have to remember again that kind of like there's there's the specific mediums of of like of the thing you know like I'm a, it's some um, 
you know, Vonnegut again is a writer and, you know, Barnett Newman is a painter and, you know, kind of, it's, it's very, you know, I, I don't know if like, you know, it's, I, I, I'm not very moved by the idea of kind of like trying to find figurative meaning in a work. And again, I take his defense for the work to be um, not kind of look at the work figuratively in anything in the second book. It has kind of made, that's kind of made into a kind of like a, a very private idiosyncratic thing where he talks about, you know, uh, but, but the idea that kind of, um, you know, abstract values pervade life more than we realize kind of like all kind of are kind of online abstract values and painting online with life more than we, we perhaps realize or, but, um, you know, he's just, he's just a good writer. And, and I, and I don't think it's, um, um, I don't think it's, it's the case all the time that, I mean, what else do you say that, um, um, uh, that, um, you know, um, I'm, try, I'm sorry, I'm trying to re recall kind of the, the first part of your point as well, because um, it, it's some, um, um, we, we, ha we can't always take what the characters say at face value too. Like uh, it's, it's, it's a very, it's not the first time he appears in the book either. He's like mentioned before as, you know, his painting sells for, um, you know, an, an extraordinary amount of money. Yeah. And there was even a story, I think it was somewhere in the nineties where they sold blue poles to um, the Jackson Pollock painting to the Sydney museum of modern art. And there was a huge outrage about it because it sold for something like, I think it was only like something like seven, 8 million, but people in Australia were incensed. Absolutely. The, incensed the outrage was that it was too expensive. Was that the outrage? Yes. Yes, oh, I, I mean, to, to be honest, personally, I think it's one of his lesser paintings, really. So, you know, they probably actually did get a bad deal. But it's, but it's this kind of, you know, if, you know, um, um, you know, if, um, um, if really the thing that wins people over and the thing that has the most influence in the world isn't artists or even critics, it's the kind of the, the collectors and the kind of the, the sort of the gallerists class, you know, what you see the most often that sort of makes, you know, if you see something enough, you just, you know, you know eventually mm -hmm. kind of, it's not strange anymore and kind of seems perfectly normal. Um, I was sort of, so, but so, I mean, as an argument, like a sort of like a, a defense of abstract art is pretty good. Um, and I think actually it was first, I remember first time reading it, in breakfast chat we're talking about different blip now but it's good but um i remember almost being a sort of a halfway sort of house argument oh maybe abstract paintings don't look better if you think about them in figurative terms but now i kind of like looking back on it i realized that it, there's more to it than that and kind of it is a good agreement for that i don't think it somehow goes you know um you know again the painting isn't real so i can't say you know it's a better it's a better sort of as art it's better than the painting because the painting is but like still i think you know it, it's it's good right arting it's art writing it's good art about art it's really it's really um um you know i think it's it's it's, really it's, it's, it's so bleak it's so bleak but in a good way like you know there is a way yes. to do that yeah, like you know yeah. yeah like be, before we start recording you said something about um you know there, there's like a always like a lot of like uh bad you know like cultural writing that's trying to like you know turn art into something else you know, like I, I think of uh, James Baldwin's book, uh, The Devil Finds Work. It's a book of film criticism, but he's not really evaluating, you know, all the time, like quality. Yeah. Right. But he is drawing lots of like really wonderful connections between culture and American history and, you know, what America was like at the time uh, that he was writing the book. So, I yeah. mean, there are there are definitely ways of doing that. Right. Um, it, you know, it, but it's extremely difficult to do that. Well, you know, perhaps it's even more difficult to do that than it is to, you know, have like objectively good criticism of, you know, like adjudicating whether, you know, one painting yeah. is better than another. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, criticism as a whole, especially when it comes to fine art, I mean, like we've talked about, like about like um, the whole danger of like being a novelist trying to sort of deal with the other fine arts too and how there are certain habits they fall into, but um, just criticism in general, you know, is, is, is a tricky one, you know, like um, I'm, there's all sorts of people like Greenberg, um, there's sort of stuff I can take or leave and there's, but there's other things that, that, uh, you know, um, 
they're, they're already there in a Polonaire. You know, you don't need to go to Greenberg. Like a Polonaire is writing that sort of stuff. And Diderot, uh, a guy who had terrible taste in paintings, but wrote some of the best criticism of painting ever. Um, you know, and it's it's like a, that. You know, criticism just as much as painting, like you know, can be filled with all kinds of contradictory things, all kind of contradictory values. And unless you're in the know, or else you particularly enjoy people presenting to you kind of contradictory values, uh, it can be quite kind of you know alienating, or kind of you, you feel like you know, just give me a side man, or kind of like a uh, yeah. like a but. But I like your. I I do like that oblique thing mm -hmm. where kind of you know it's not just some critic. I talk, you listen, kind of shit. You know, it's you know I don't like that. You know, I don't I don't need to be you know some master telling me like how to make up my own fucking mind. Um, but I I like but I like people to I like people to playfully sort of introduce as it were kind of and you know there are these amazing anecdotes about greenberg you know greenberg like wrote some essays of middling quality but his real value was kind of he would make these visits to art schools in england for instance i've heard stories about this secondhand from other people but one time he visits i believe it's the um some sort of college in cambridge or something like that and he walks around the studio and he comes up to this sort of abstract sculptor who's like spent ages you know working on this floor-based angular sort of gym, um sort of um anthony caro style sort of sculpture sort of constructed sculpture not um actually chiseled or anything like that it's welded stuff and he's waiting there and always oh, can't wait to see what clement greenberg says and clement greenberg comes up and looks at it a bit it says what's so good about right angles and then just goes away <laughs> like mm -hmm. and it's like and it cuts right to the core of the thing. Like the guy's like, you know, what is good about right angles? <laughs> Why was he out? Like, um, uh, comes up to another person's work. Have you tried taking that out of the middle? No? All right. Like, um, uh, like it's just all this stuff that anyone could say in a way, you know, or you could imagine anyone could say, even kind of people who don't know much about art, but absolutely is the most raised, you know, it's like kind of, I think the best criticism is like that, you know, like it's, it's like, um, um, it, there has to be a kind of a, you know, like if you'd almost lingered there and tried to kind of, you know, in a long winded way, kind of tell them exactly why, blah, 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 but like why they should do that. It would have taken away the, the force, the perlocutionary force of the criticism, the, the, the rhetorical nature is part of it. The fact that kind of, it has to be dropped and accountably, and, but it, but at the same time, how then how that absolutely clears away the cobwebs somehow, you know, we get all this in Bluebeard, we're, we're getting all this stuff that kind of in a way should, you know, great again, because it represents all this grating contradictory stuff in our life and society. It should in a way be just as grating and just as much as an irritant for us. But in a sense, it helps to clear away the cobwebs. Mm -hmm. By the end of by the end of the novel, we go kind of like we're we're, we're you know we're, we're thinking on the way you know what's what is so good about paintings of great men of history or or um, uh, what, yeah what is good about you know um, uh, people you know spending hours drawing a fucking cow you know or like you know I've seen enough paintings of this done well and um, to by the end you're kind of going kind of oh, well you know maybe so all along the way it's kind of like you're being led in a kind of gingerly kind of way like one place to the other with this sort of thing and and not you're not being forced into it it's kind of it's, I, you know i'm not saying this work is some sort of critical exegesis where he's kind of laying out manifesto like his ideas about fine art or whatever but it is it is book. oblique right that's why it works yeah. right the, the obliqueness good, makes it it's work. a good book it's a good narrative and and you know it's it's and it, it it's a good it's a good i think it's a good sort of um book to kind of it, it does give you a kind of it, it gives you a sense of some sort of clarity you know you do feel coming away from this book kind of like that you know um well when i first read it and when i read it i was a little bit kind of like i was at a highly sort of pressurized point in my life when you're coming out of art school you know you go you kind of you feel very jaded about certain things maybe kind of like you read this book and you go kind of like um 
you kind of can't like you come away from it with this kind of yeah you know like like, like a serious art but not to be kind of a self-serious loser you know kind of like you know, like i think that's i think that's what he represents in the most broad stupid if i had to essentialize vonnegut that's what he represents you know kind of like mm-hmm. high-mindedness but a, a, not a sort of like a, a fear of kind of like narcissism you know like an absolute sort of refusal of that kind of like like you were saying like cultural like chauvinism like um uh, mm-hmm. like um what 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 do you like self sanctimonious kind of thing like because i mean i mean I, you i mean i don't know how many artists like i'm um, you're friends with that you like meet, you know, socialize with but i i meet an awful lot of people who are like really quite narcissistic uh, you know, artists who have all sorts of kind of high f- i mean they're not dan Gregory. that's the norm right that's kind of the norm i think yeah 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 but yeah. I, I mean god i could tell you a story about a chap i met the other day who like you know, like he really did believe he was the second coming of christ but like there's that grain of narcissism in every artist and in a way i think it's almost kind of unavoidable you need to be a little bit self-obsessed yes. I mean, you need, you you need, need ego to, right you you just need yeah. to have the ego not get out of control and you know blur your vision right in terms of reality but in, in a way everyone needs a little bit of ego not just that yeah. it's everyone yes, needs a little i bit. agree it's a problem it's a problem of, it's, so it's a, so it's a creative problem but it's also a universal humane problem and it's like it's so so in a way we're sat here talking about art like in a way, all of that, all of what Vonnegut's talking about with that, is really just a metaphor for, for, for what's really just, you know, the human. And, you know, we talked, we touched upon this idea of humanism earlier. Um, humanism is just as conflicted as art because, obviously, to make art is to be human. And it, 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 it's, <laughs> gosh, isn't this philosophical? But this is, this is the entirely thing where we were having our last conversation was saying like, oh, really, Vonnegut, an anti-humanist? But he, he's a card-carrying humanist. Yes, but, um, but humanism, you know, I was talking to um, Zeke the other day and you know, he was you know, saying like, um, um, you know, I think he is a pessimist in a way. I think there is a lot of really um, negative, like in a way kind of horror in Vonnegut, a horror he feels towards the world. In a way, just just a reality. Oh, we have to, you know, life, death. Jesus Christ, it's pretty heavy. Um, where, but, where would you but, put him on the spectrum, though? Like, you know, like optimist, pessimist, realist. Yeah, I, I think he could be called a realist more than anything. I, I don't. Maybe. I don't. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily understand the, the scale there. Like, I, I, I don't think he's a, a nihilist. Is the important thing. I think he 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 obviously in this book especially, um, I mean it's it's I mean in a way, hatred of women and mis- and like cruelty towards women is really kind of the metaphor kind of for the for like the larger problem of like you know humans are really cruel it's a kind of cruel and feeling universe and kind of but that's you know the 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 kindness of women like I mean maybe it's a bit of a even maybe who knows how well it's ended it's aged now I mean like I've known all sorts of cruel women and like I'm a, and you know uh, but. Yeah, the idea of kind of like effeminate sort of kindness and warmth, like the value of love and kindness and charity, like it is like is a huge thing in this. I mean, I mean that's kind of the thing that kind of is sort of the redemptive thing about Cersei Berman in a way, and about sort of the other kind of um sort of in a way quite the the minor sort of figures in sort of um Rabbi Karabekin's life who are women, kind of in a way that's kind of the fact that they're all these women who help the men along. And as such, sort of positive forces, but like, just no, no one, no one thinks about them or spares a second for them. Like, um, God, isn't it great? This kind of that maternal instinct, kind of in nature, it's like it's the one thing that's really good about nature. That kind of like, you know, um, that you know, we want to care for things sometimes, or we want, or just um, on the whim, we'll just kind of we'll be we'll see a vulnerable person, or and we'll want to protect them sometimes. I mean, like this is. Um, it's in a way this is antithetical to nature right or, or most or the way that most of kind of you know the way things go and but but that's precisely what makes it valuable you know realism i don't know because in a way like you know god it's just a word and it can mean especially in the arts it's a very loaded term isn't it realism but um i i think he he's kind of maybe uh, how does he square it with nietzsche well, 
you know, from what from what I know of Nietzsche, you know, and I, I'm quite a big fan of Nietzsche. Um, I mean, they're, they're both conflicted uh, they're both, humanists, right? That's I, I think that's one way to put it. I mean, yeah, is yeah. I, I used to describe Nietzsche as a closet humanist, uh, rather funnily. But to provo- I mean, th- this whole idea that um, uh, wh- I mean, this way of thinking, like I mean, Nietzsche doesn't like transcendental thinking. He doesn't like people being out of this world and far away. He likes high mindedness. Mm-hmm. He likes seriousness, yeah. but he doesn't like people, this idea, which is there in so much fucking philosophy, even atheistic philosophy, this world isn't real. There's a world, you know, there's in the real world after that. Mm. Um, it, the, uh, like he's keen to rid the world of that, but he's also very keen to rid the world of nihilism. Nietzsche is very against nihilism, which is to him is the consequence of the abandonment of God. Of the abandonment of all this sort of stuff um you know how can we be the theme of nature in a way is the theme of uh, maybe it's a, a strain here now sorry but i do this sometimes when i get all manic and like oh we're talking about art but the theme is the same theme in, in bluebeard how can we be our own creators um uh this is the question posed by the onset of modernity um you know it, it, uh, um uh if you just look at the world of shadows you'll never sh- the existence of a shadow you know and then you fade away um so uh, like it's a it's a ref- it's a it's a bleak thing but in this novel particularly in a way which isn't isn't quite there in a lot of other Vonnegut novels it ends with this note of affirmation too you know and you know i think that you know there's there's very moving conclusions to some vomit novels where you know you almost feel a lump in your throat but i don't think they're quite as affirming as kind of the end of, of bluebeard where you know where kind of you know uh, we we really get to go into the shed and we you know we get this summer you know now it's the women's turn uh, what do you want to kind of talk about that i'd be interested to know kind of what your thoughts are about kind of you know that as a conclusion and, and the painting itself now it's the women's turn or you know, is that the name for it i believe yeah, um, I mean, it, it's an interesting uh, title, right? Like, mm-hmm. in the sense that, like, go, going back to what we were saying about this kind of, like, you know, effeminate kindness. I mean, this is you know, beyond even, like, the books, right? Kurt Vonnegut's own life. Many, if not most artists, are narcissists. You see this, you know, playing out negatively in their relationships, right? They mistreat their wives or they mistreat their husbands. Like, you know, again and again, this is just because, you know, they're self-absorbed, right? So it's like, it's hard to, yeah. you know, it's hard to not ignore other people. Like, I mean, you know, I, I, I have to be, I have to always remind myself consciously, like Alex, like you have people in your life that love you and respect you and that you love and respect. You have to make mm-hmm. time for them, right? You have to be kind to them. You have to uh, make sure that they continue being part of your life. Uh, irrespective of the fact that you also have this Nietzschean desire to, you know, overcome the self and to be greater than all the time for its own sake, right? Mm-hmm. You know, as an artist, mm-hmm. and yeah. Vonnegut, you know, he was, uh, you know, he he took in, you know, so many kids that weren't uh, his biological children. He was constantly yeah, I've heard about that, yeah. Yeah, he was, you know, constantly feeling kind of, you know, underwater in a sense and always like working hard. You know, it, it's mm-hmm. not surprising this comes out, you know, in his books. Uh, this idea of you know now it's the women's turn. Um, I mean, there's there's a couple things, right? There's you know there's a slightly sinister reading in the sense that um, you know we have this uh, uh, you know we have this kind of like war uh, that has just mm-hmm. ended, right? And mm-hmm. you know what what usually happens is in a war is you know the men get killed off. And then it's the women's turn, right? Which means they get raped mm. and oftentimes, you know, killed after the fact. Um, mm. But then also, you know, this this is a painting that's done uh, uh, on the day in Europe after the war, right? So mm. uh, right after the war, there, it's supposed to be this kind of, you know, optimistic kind of end. Um, um, and that, reconstru- and that, Reconstruction yeah. as well, kind of like if you think about sort of the post-war sort of socialist view of kind of Europe, I mean, mm-hmm. like in Britain, we had Clement Attlee's NHS and the idea of the um, welfare state which was yeah. kind of part of the optimistic you know, as well as kind of, you know, the booming of America as a superpower. So yeah, optimism, but like you're saying yeah. also kind of the women's turn. Yeah. Well, 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 well also, well, also, well, also now the women's turn being like, okay, if 
this is the world that men have created historically again and again and again. They seem to be creating the same kinds of worlds again and again. Um, mm. What kind of, you know, what kind of world might these women here create, right? As they're, you know, coming out, you know, from the rubble, right? As they are, you know, uh, now survivors, right? In this kind of a, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's a post-apocalyptic uh, landscape yeah. in some ways, right? So that's another way that I would read the title um, of the painting. In a way, it's it makes it makes us um we were saying as well that kind of um Marigny and sort of remember we were saying that um she was the one sending letters to Robert Karabekian. Mm -hmm. She 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 was kind of um um you know uh and that she was in a way much more kind of his kindred spirit, like much more kind of um a nurturing influence, you know, because I mean, she was always around and she would go to art galleries with him. So like, I'm a, uh, the, the idea is that kind of like, I'm um, sort of, they, all this is coming, can come out of the background. And you know, by the end, like, Marion Lee has married a guy and she has kind of influence and power and lackeys. There's this idea that kind of, you know, the tables literally turn and kind of mm -hmm. the pockets turn as well. So kind of like the a shift of a balance of powers. It's like, I'm a, that um yeah i mean the, the idea that literally kind of um uh now women have op the opportunity to sort of like make their own choices and follow their own passions and be artists in their own right too um which is kind of you know which is kind of was was you know in in vonnegut's time was kind of it's like happening you know like a, even kind of in you know, the modern art world you know if we think about abex it is a very male dominated thing I mean, there were female abstract expressionists, but again, most of their recognition is much later, retrospective, posthumous, actually. Um, I mean, the second gen of Abexers, there's a lot more women, um, Helen Frankenthaler, Joanne Mitchell, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, it's, but now, all the biggest selling kind of modern artists in the way, kind of like the fine artists, are kind of are kind of like women or else they are kind of, um, people who you know previously you know it used to be like incredibly shocking you know, Basquiat he's black and he's selling you know in like galleries but but now it's um, um now it's 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 much more kind of a, a diverse sort of thing and it's like um uh, it's much less it represents a much less narrow cast of sort of you know human society human culture I mean um may I mean maybe it is just the case that kind of he's saying here that kind of like maybe it is a male problem. You know, like not that men are the problem, but like you know, maybe it is kind of the fact that kind of um, is 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 there something about kind of men? You know, yeah. like um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like uh, I, I am kind way, of pessimistic it's, it's, about that, though. You know, like I, I don't necessarily believe that women would create a a better society. I mean, like and like going back to this idea of like what did you know? Don't trust a survivor until you find out what they did to survive. Well, yeah. what did she do to survive? Did she, she essentially yeah. forged an alliance with a fascist. You could say it's for the sake of surviving, yeah, but, yeah. but 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 af after the fact, after the war is over, after she forged this alliance, she could now and, ride off into the sunset mind. rich, right? She now has like, you know, she still has the trappings of power, right? I think um, it's very important. She doesn't give it up. Out. It's also very important to point out that the guilt she puts on Rabo Karabekin, and in a way the guilt that Rabo Karabekin assumes I think it's entirely unfair. Um, mm -hmm. I agree. He is not responsible for getting Mar for Marangi's abuse. He he is not an enabler of her abuse. He was a child. Um, he was in love from her from the beginning, and like you know, she she. I mean, again, she didn't have a lot she could do. Like she was kind of um, in an abusive relationship. But the fact that by the end, kind of like she's all saying she's making him feel so guilty. I'm putting it, it feels kind of manipulative when she's the one who brought him over she's the one you know, who pulled and then we have Cersei Berman who in her own way is a kind of manipulator kind of like in a way get, she gets what she wants you know um, so there is this kind of this kind of thing and you know he has this kind of testy relationship with her mm -hmm. where you know when he brings out the painting and says it's called now it's a women's term I think though that um um it's it is what women represent in an abstract sense maybe mm -hmm. that we should be thinking of rather than i think maybe that's the interesting thing in the book to juxtapose because like 
I think that um, because in a way um, there is this tension between you know how people act and how they present and you know what they say and what they don't do I mean there's a lot of hypocrisy and there's a lot of people sort of trying to have it both way in the book I would say you know um, as opposed to kind of well the only people who um, now, I won't make that point. I was going to make some sort of point about Jackson Pollock as well. But but the, the point is to say that kind of like there's kind of the abstract idea of kind of what women represent, which in a way, um, Rabbo is always kind of feels that he's always been denied or, what, or which he kind of is, is kind of alienated from or a distance from, which is kind of precisely this sort of um, open sort of view of the world, a sort of receptive, social, warm kind of like um, idea of, you know, and this feeling that kind of like um, he can't satisfy or can't sort of m- m- sustain a relationship with women, like uh, or that you know that it's inherently conflicted. You know that this thing with with Bermuda or you know with uh, Marilyn rather that implodes. So it, it's kind of like there's this, this there's this idea that he thinks women represent or should represent or kind of in a way um, that they um. um um you know that, that kind of that they uh well just represent i suppose but in, in that that now it's the women's turn it's like a challenge like right? now women have to live up to this abstract value not just yeah, exactly all right yeah or well, well not just in the sense of kind of like now it's women's turn to cock things up just like we have or mm-hmm. now it's women's turn to make the world right it's like now women um now, now, now it's the women's turn to figure out what kind of those values mean for them kind of like you know all these things which kind of like previously you know like um, uh, uh, we, we felt we've had we've in a way had to exclude from our world kind of as artists as men kind of like you know now let's see kind of what what those what those things really mean in you know in the you know in the context of a world where kind of women can have, uh, you know, do have sort of autonomy or kind of um, uh, uh, what have you. So, yeah, because I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I do, th- I, I mean, I don't love it as an ending to the book, actually. And, you know, I would have been probably, I would have liked for them to go into the shack and found something else except that painting, um, honestly. And I can't tell you what would have been better because, you know, at that point, you know, it could have been anything, yeah. couldn't it? So, but, it's nice and it's yeah. good and it's and it ties up the themes of the novel nicely and it sort of you know it brings to a head the whole theme of like the whole gender relationships in the, in the books and you know men and women um but yeah uh it's do you what i mean do you think that um, um do you think that um like the the painting is supposed to be like a, a magnum opus like a like a um do you do you see it as kind of um um Yes, I mean, joke, yeah, sort, sort the of. Whole I mean, joke about, yeah. The whole joke about the sort of the, the what were they called? The Duralux or um, um, roller, roller, what are they called? The, 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 the Satin Duralux that yeah, basically well, one of the plot points is uh, he does all these, uh, uh, you know, paintings uh, using this paint. It's a made up name, Satin yeah. Duralux that eventually just kind of like self destruct. So that that's why he becomes, you know, this joke in the art world, not because he's necessarily a bad painter. But because, you know, and that's kind of like the commercial side of things, right? The commercial part of the art world pokes fun of him. Whereas like, you know, the actual critiques that he takes to heart is when people tell him, you know, you're a good technician, but there's no actual rainbow Caribbean mm. anywhere in these paintings mm. either, right? Mm. That's what he and takes to like heart. He always feel, well, he always feels that kind of like, that's the point, doesn't he? Like, I mean, like he doesn't want... Mm-hmm. Well, he's kind of afraid to. You know, that's the whole point to empty out yeah. the stuff of all that stuff. But then, but then, what's what's interesting as well is that he compares himself to that other fictional painter in the book. I forget his name, but he has this friend who I think also died. Kitchen you know, Terry death. Kitchen or something Terry Kitchener Kitchener. Kitchener. Yeah, yeah uh, he's made Kitchen up Kitchen. And, yeah, Kitchen. Kitchen was rather. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he always name. compares himself like negatively to that painter, which is yeah. interesting too. So like, I mean, he, there's um, a there's a sort of inadequacy there to where kind of he always fe- he almost feels like the abstract art is, art is kind of harder in a way. Well, he, he he kind of he's proud of the 
well, he, he feels shame because they're, they're made with this bad um, consumer acrylic that decays and, and they, he becomes like this joke. It's very funny, I think. Um, but uh, he, he, there's this sort of the story of like um, his friend who is implied as a closet homosexual, I believe. Um, but no, they're kind of like repressed person. And, and it's, um, you know, who, who kind of has this sort of pollock drip moment where kind of he kind of doesn't really know what he wants. Is is the opposite of um, um of Rabo and who's like a, a super slick technician, like absolute master draftsman, doesn't do all of that. I kind mm. of stumbles into greatness, like in an uncalculated kind of way, kind of all like we're, we're led to believe that he um that he um contrives this kind of kind of Jules Zanitsky style spray rig where he like uses aerosol and like um, and that this has and some sort of incredibly sensuous result that kind of uh, and mm. that, but then there's also that joke as well that there's a little seg that one of the most talked about paintings of his has some sort of rabo Karabekian um a fragment in it that rabo Karabekian like contributes mm. a yeah, I remember that. A, a little a little sort of hidden foot or also is it like a foot that he puts in the painting or something i um, forget but but it's a similar thing that he does with his like you know final painting where you know like mm. little like little bits and pieces uh little corners are supposed to be you know it, it, like it's it reminds me like the way it's, it's described reminds me very much of like you know like what looking at a bosch painting is like right these like th th those kinds of details you know what i mean well kind of um, like a brug like brugal kind of like um well when, well, when I read kind of um, the description of um, now it's the women's turn, it sort of sounded to me like like a Bruegel kind of like, you know, painting, yeah. you know, like you get with the That's sort of like, like a big complicated scene. Like, um, like uh, what, what else have we not talked about with a novel that we really should, do you think, Alex? Well, well one, one thing uh, I guess we could close on this is, um, so you sure. know, in our notes back and forth, uh, uh, I, I I do take your point. So like w w one thing that I um, mentioned is like, oh, let's, let's talk about the fact that, you know, there's a, there's this kind of like commercial critique going on in some ways early on where when uh, Dan Gregory describes his apprenticeship and he was asked to essentially oh, yeah. cr create, you know, this hyper-realistic ruble that could pass for a true ruble at the marketplace. And, um, you know, he, he, he tries to do that. That seems mm -hmm. to be a kind of commercial critique. And, and your response was, you know, you don't have to take that so literally because we have, you know, examples in the past, right? We have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Greece, we have, you know, the, the famous uh, painting of grapes that, you know, birds are trying to eat and they crash into it. We have, um, you know, the the Pope asks for a perfect painting and you get this mm -hmm. perfect circle. But to me, it's mm -hmm. almost like, you know, those other examples are simply, you know, the specific cultural and historical strains that are specific to those periods. So when we think of the way that art is treated in ancient Greece, uh, it, at least, you know, mythologically, right, we have uh, uh, myths, for example, where poets would show up you know uh on cliffs and uh they would sort of you know battle each other almost in a way that rappers battle each other today and the ones that have the inferior poetry have to be thrown off a fucking cliff or something right so yeah. you have this like hyper kind of competitive aspect that would be represented by hey can we do something so realistic that birds will mistake it for actual food then we get to you know uh, uh you know a pope asking for perfection and he gets a perfect circle and that has like you know that has a spiritual element to it this like you know the circle has like symbol uh, a symbolic kind of meaning to it that you know uh, greeks or romans probably wouldn't give you know two shits about they would they would rather have this kind of more competitive edge and then we get to you know the ruble the ruble speaks mm -hmm. to another cultural current, and that is, you know, uh, you always had obviously some level of commercialization, but obviously this mm -hmm. th this kind of you know goes into hyperdrive, you know, in the nineteenth and twentieth and twenty first centuries. So, you yeah. know, maybe if you have like any comments on that, um, you mean uh, I mean the commodification of art. I mean, um, well, obviously it's a bit it's a big part of the. Um, 
well, not a big bit, it's part of the criticism of the novel. And you've you've read the um, uh, introduction where he mentions that kind of this this almost it's easy in a way for me to for for and other people to get incensed about these huge even artists do. I mean, like even Gerhard Richter, the the greatest selling the highest selling living artist today, there's a little documentary where they follow him around the gallery. This multi-millionaire points to uh, the label and goes, oh, look at that. My painting shouldn't work, be cost that much. Yeah, painting shouldn't cost more than a house. And I kind of go, get used to it. <laughs> like, this, mm-hmm. like, I mean, you, you're not going to sleep at night if you're like, you set up awake going kind of like, oh, paintings cost a lot of money. Like, it's very easy for us to feel kind of revolted by the, by the market and by by the way in which kind of uh, seemingly kind of things that like art that we we shouldn't fe- we feel sh- in principle shouldn't have a price on them can be given these prices and then we feel incensed when they're really high um it that doesn't mean we shouldn't object to put these things about the market we should actually and it's a very good idea to but um what we get with with um, um you know it's not it's not so much that so rabbi karabeki for instance is himself a dealer and he's kind of like basically he kind of like quite enjoys the role actually of being this kind of um yeah yeah this this tasteful dealer of sort of um, um sort of luxurious sort of decorative you know art objects you know it, and um uh, and uh i i think in in a way I mean, what, I, have to, I have some notes about it actually. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the commentary about commerce isn't, I think, the thing that sort of stands out um, as as clearly. But I would say, you know, above all the other kind of themes. But you know, um, uh, I think if if anything, it, 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 Vonnegut's criticism of America that's kind of not just in this novel, but in other novels, is that kind of capital becomes the value system of everyone and money becomes the value system of everyone. Um, that kind of, you know, um, and, and in a way it's uh, it, it, like, you know, kind of like it, it sort of goes hand in hand with kind of the solipsism that he's kind of, uh, and nihilism, I suppose, that he's kind of trying to, resist uh, as an author as, and as an individual i suppose you know as a as a man as you say but um uh, sort of what we know about about dan gregory though and dan gregory you know th- there are propinquities between him and um Karabekian and some of some of which um Karabekian is aware of others which he probably isn't so much and is probably kind of more ironic um the thing about dan gregory is that he is this kind of um you know he is he's this sort of professional you know immigrant done good you know mm-hmm. work like you know working immigrant son of an immigrant whatever made good and so if he succeeds and he's successful and kind of like i'm a the idea is kind of this this amazing story he has of him like it's it's, it's always I just, I, i'm chuckling like thinking about him where he's like he's like jumping around the living room of his old master with this ruble going i've destroyed you you know i've defeated you you know i am no longer your servant like i have made you look like a fool you know mm. <laughs> it's it's like it's just it's like those old stories i was telling you about there's the same kind of dialogue in that like literally the way people talk to each other in those things, like they're, they're turning around and they're going, um, um, you boasted about being the greatest artist of all time. And yet here you are in front of all these crowds of people. I have, um, uh, I've made you and nature itself like idiots. You know, mm-hmm. there's this sense that we're kind of like, you know, in all these stories, like, um, um, uh, the, the kind of the master gets the better of everybody. And in a way he gets the better, he kind of in the process he kind of trashes the values of, of of society that he's like he trashes the very values of the thing he's trying to climb up you know like he's like um uh, he beats the master but in doing so he kind of absolutely destroys everything the master stands for so like in a way like there's that contradiction too like you know all, 
all this money like it turns into a total carry on and he's like you know um, um you know you'll get mocked up for this and you know they'll they'll get you for forgery and and what have you and like um, uh, it's it, it, it travesties money as well as kind of like his master's principles and you know, his and his like the security he has of being the avuncular figure teaching the student um kind of uh, um and then what does what does in, in the same way that um that Karabekian, um, um, you know, he, he's challenged to, to produce a work of, you know, stunning uh, realism. Yes, he's, he's challenged mm. to, pr- and in a way, um, like, continues to kind of have this chip on his shoulder, his, his whole life about realism. It, uh, and, you know, uh, isn't kind of um, um, Dan Gregory kind of like, in a way, kind of like, he becomes like, uh, like a total kind of like snob total kind of like society kind of like hack you know he's the hack and Karabek and sees him very much as the hack you know the guy who is like achieving socialite has all these celebrity friends who he doesn't get on with but like he he's like um, um he becomes like the success story he becomes the that kind of guy and i mean and in a way making it in america is kind of like heaven you know like it, that is kind of the afterlife. That's the sort of like being a celebrity, being wealthy is kind of the the promise of America. It's like this amazing promise. I mean, like in a way, you know, the job of um, um, you know Vonnegut, as opposed to poke holes in it and go, you know, what does success mean? You know, it might not be the 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 cakewalk you thought it was, but like ju- just that. I mean, kind of the sort of the. American of itself is kind of like a contradiction in that term. You know, with the onset of modernity, you know, um, with this huge technological upheaval, you have these great gains, but you also have a certain kind of alienation which goes hand in hand with that. You know, you have the the amazing suburbs for the new nuclear family, but you also have the, the boom of prescription Xanax and sort of antidepressants for domesticated housewives. You know, you have all this money in the cities and in the financial sectors and whatever. Um, yeah, the painting was going up, but then um, the people who own them don't really care, or they eat their dinner kind of like beneath them, like uh, beneath these fancy sort of mantelpiece, mantelpiece um, hangings, and uh, yeah, or, or else the people who go in the galleries kind of like you know it's a big joke to them, like uh, but so so it's some um, so money, um, you know, is it, it, kind of it, it's another kind of way of american life it's another fixture of our modern life that kind of um that vonnegut is, is just is, is is travestying a little bit and is kind of saying that but again i don't think kind of because like i was we were saying earlier the most philistine criticism you can make about modern art is it's all about money or it's just a fad you know we might even be right sometimes when we say it. you know a broken clock is right twice a day isn't it but you know, yeah, you know, and it's right to object to kind of like the gross amounts of money and like you know the, the cronyism and the corruption, um, but kind of like going on about it, kind of it's a, it's a bit like you know, I come on, come on, this is like a fixture of our lives at this point. You know, like a, you might as well get mad about um, you know uh, the internet. You know, like it's not going to do anything about it. Getting mad about it, like um. Uh, um and you can't write a letter to someone complaining or like or an essay where everyone's convinced suddenly oh yes money's a bad thing let's give it up uh, it's it's um, um but it's another thing that he has to that he has to kind of in a way um he kind of has to he kind of has to de-transcendentalize demystify de sort of bring down and sort of like you know because money in a way is no substitute for kind of like whatever high-minded kind of theories you want to live your life by or like or it can't just be the thing you know mm. um dan, dan gregory i mean maybe his 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 he's not driven by money um but i mean but his values are all fucked you know it's um, um like his priorities are all fucked his view of history is fucked his view of other people are fucked money is another distortion basically of whatever we want to call it the real or stuff it, it's it's not you know if as, as you know so i don't know i don't know if this is um you know if the if the novel the novel could say more about money actually it there's it touches on it here and there so that's why i'm a bit confused by that beginner where he says you know what, what Mavonlegat says um 
blatantly sort of explicitly i was repulsed by money and so that was kind of an impetus for writing this kind of yeah, but it, yeah it's, it's, you know. it's just like a symbol though of that kind of distortion you know what i mean um yeah, you know, yeah another I, level it, it's what money it's is also many, yeah. yeah it's one of many sort of illusions in the book like but sorry go ahead i mean money is also kind of like you know it, it's, it's 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 also a bit of a drug in the sense that um you know, it's true that like, you know, alcoholism or whatever might bring out, you know, propensities that a person already has. Right. But on another level, uh, it also creates a hole that might otherwise not be there. Right. Money does the same thing. Right. It intensifies, it definitely intensifies certain propensities, but it also creates vacancies. Right. That other things uh, like just just rush to fill. Right. And I mean, you know, uh, we definitely can see this in the art world, right? We could see this in the current, um, you know, currently, like what is being sold, you know, as NFTs, for example, you know, it is trash, right? It is uh, almost exclusively trash. Um, and that's not to say that these things can't change in the future, but, uh, ag you know, again and again, right? Uh, this is this is the kind of thing the money does. It It intensifies inclinations but it also creates vacancies and other things rush to fill those vacancies because money has this way of like you know it's it, it's it's power in the sense that it always seeks to multiply itself right and that's the danger yeah, so I, 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 I yeah yeah i i think i think that that uh, there there is a contention that a certain that a certain point um you know art especially American art has tried to solve the problem of kind of like a low audience interest with crude sensationalism mm -hmm. or, um, you know, um, or sort of, you know, or, or kind of like, or the fact that kind of like um, it tries to substitute for the, the art, the art is trying to substitute for the fact that kind of art has no identity anymore. I mean, it's, these are also kind of cliches too. I mean, like, I think, you know, it's NFTs. The big, the biggest problem with NFTs is isn't necessarily for so. For instance, where people like talk about like all the money in the art world, I always think, you know, why do people complain about money in the art world? You know, Jesus Christ, there's fucking money everywhere. I mean, just think about sports. The amount of corruption and cronyism and bullshit that goes on in sports that really should totally render a lot of it kind of absolutely you know meaningless or arbitrary or what have you or at the you know just open the floodgates and let everybody compete with whatever you know cyborg limbs seven heads just you know just fucking do it i don't care if someone's doping but you know this in fifa the set blatter um scandal of kind of you know cash for favors yeah you know, this uh but also kind of in the way that money re reconstructs businesses i mean just look at uber look at what money like mm -hmm. has done like are there and like all this new stuff like there's so much crazy um uh, corruption and uh and inflation and like numbers have to go up everywhere like i mean people have been seeing record profits in all sort of domains like uh over the last couple of years especially during covid people are making money hand over foot fist like what's, what's the phrase hand over fist um, yeah, that's the phrase. But, but um it's not a problem that's specific to the art world is, is my thing so when people kind of single in on art it either tells you that there's some sort of thing within them where, where people really feel that in a way in a quite traditional kind of way that there's something vulgar about money that that kind of shouldn't get mixed up in art which you know fair enough i mean i don't particularly feel that that's true i think money can can do all sorts of good things in art and you know, yeah, I mean, our artists be... ideally need to get paid. Yeah. I mean, like, if, if you just imagine, well, well, not, like, what if the greatest that, artists not just that, would always get paid? Like, that would be a good world. But not just that, but like, you know, there's there's anecdotes about Mark Rothko walking down the street in New York and seeing Warhol on the other side and shuddering, you know, like having to literally turn away because it just made him physically ill to look at Warhol. Because, like, you know, he represented such serious art, Rothko, you know, like, he really wanted, um, the new york art world to be a new renaissance like florence you know where it would be you know very earnest serious spiritual kind of art rothko represented you know um light stuff he wrote you know he liked celebrity and like like, like we were saying kind of like you know art that could be quite fun and humorous and um, um and ironic and you know it didn't ask you to accept everything about you it. mean you mean warhol and, not rothko 
Oh yeah, Warhol. sorry, Warhol. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. but but Rothko did see Warhol across the street and kind of was re- but like, yeah, yeah. And what they stand for and kind of it's, it's like one generation of art abutting against another and kind of like this kind of uh, mistrust, which which happens all the time. But um, money and sort of all this other stuff, there's there's all kinds of stuff that can be perfectly valid and you know can be perfectly good, but money isn't just like some sort of evil thing in of itself. You know, it's 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 yeah, it's I the agree it the the stuff starts at the top i mean i i say to people kind of like it used to be all the art schools in my country were free now the tour the tour has changed it where they can literally ask for like there was a cap that you could now charge for it and you could put there was a cap literally everyone asked for the cap so like now we're all paying the maximum price for like that sort of stuff but the problem isn't that we're paying for it you know i'd be quite happy to pay for it if it was a good education if it was if it was if it was worth it if, not, if, it, if it led to somewhere right it's not just well, no, you know, not, even that it, not even that it kind of there was a positive return per se but i mean maybe that's just me but just if if you know if if you know it because and that's just the thing it's it's reform like on a bigger scale is it's, like, it, it's not just capital reform it's like actually kind of there are other values too you know i i i, I read philosophy and i i, I read like philosophers of you know people who are like um, uh, capitalist realists and they really do they are a bit too obsessed with capitalism and with money and where you know you can see where they're coming from with their kind of marxist critiques there's a kind of cybernetic you know they look at society as a structure uh, flows tendencies you know uh, systems uh and they've convinced themselves that capital is like some kind of god you know it's it's in our brains it controls our way of life and it does in a way I'm not saying it doesn't but um but uh it doesn't control everything you know mm-hmm. there, there are you know there are still domains of human activity and behavior that aren't um you know com- you know um uh, com- propelled by sort of like money and by kind of what capital is doing at the moment you know um it can be shocking how capital comes through the back door and how cap and how it seems that everything nowadays can be just recommensurated to market values. Everything is displaced into the market. I mean, and that's what neoliberalism is really. Don't think, you know, don't think about all that sort of stuff. Just, just displace it into the market. Let the market deal with it. Um, and that's kind of can be a bit horrible, but there are things that, that kind of like have nothing to do with that. And it's like, I'm a, and I think, you know, art, um you know if you if you shot like um from space a million nuclear bombs and just blew this fucking like you know all the the cities to bits and we you know, we totally destroyed the world and capitalism and raised it to the ground and there were just a few of us like like a mad max people in the ruins you know and it was our job you know as like the survivors to to restart everything um after a couple of hundred years would um would capitalism come back i don't know it might it's every good it's a good chance but art would for certain you'll never sort of stamp that out. like that it's just um uh, like art is just part of like our nature in a way as human beings or or art represents human society at a certain point regardless like, it will it happens like um whereas capitalism is 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 something else you know you know, it's very trendy nowadays when people like quote um you know people like Zizek and say it's easier for people to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capital um but i don't know like i think me like i'm getting a bit sick of hearing that actually you know like i'm a you know like a you know not every you know i don't know a people who love money they make me sick you know and i don't like people who worship money but like you know I, I'm not going to get like worked up like getting mad about money. The, the Bluebeard, Bluebeard, like the whole, the whole. That's why I, I tried to stress the kind of the allegorical function of that of that thing with the ruble. You know, it's um, um it's uh, it, it's kind of like it's this turning. It's this sort of like grand, sort of very kind of didactic, sort of like fable almost, where kind of the values of kind of the master are turned back on them. And it, you know, it, it's this sort of, it's this sort of moment of sort of bittersweet triumph. And like, uh, and I think in a way, kind of Vonnegut would quite like to would have quite liked to have that for himself. In a way, many of us would have quite liked to have had that. 
wouldn't we? Like if you if you have an avuncular figure who's like to like, wouldn't you have wouldn't you love to have a moment where you could you could in a way uh, put them in their place and in a way have it both ways destroy what they stand for but at the way beating them on their own terms mm. wouldn't you love to do that in a way we all would like I went to art school and I had teachers who kind of like you know um, were quite sort of like uh, and in a way capital is that for us in a, in a sense capital is the success by which we must all measure us you know like um, you know whatever you do Alex kind of with your novels whatever I do with my drawings kind of people will ask kind of oh who are you published with? Where do you show? Exactly. Do you, they, you they always ask like, the most that, boring fucking questions. These idiots. But we should we should we probably quite, we should probably we, we should probably wrap this up pretty soon. I yeah, should be going to but sleep. But just to say, we we would. I'm sorry. I I should probably go to sleep too. But only just to say that we would all quite like to um, be successful on our own terms. Mm. But we'd all in our hearts also quite like to be to just be super successful. Just to fucking shut everybody up and put them in their place like yes I, i've gotten the perfunctory achievements you know it, well I, I i i've always said though that like you know if somebody would just like pay me just to like write and i could like go in a cloister somewhere and not ever give interviews never talk to anyone i would yeah, never fucking never talk to anyone his- again but, you know but alex that's like literally never happened in the history of no like, i know but, but, but that's Michelangelo, that's what i'm saying like i i, I, I I, I, I think to, there like, ought to be argue like with the Pope, you know, like about yeah, like, like, but, but, I don't like, want to do this. I don't want to do this. <laughs> but but like aspirationally, right? Uh, I don't think there's enough people that would be comfortable with that, right? They would want like, oh, I want people to like tell me about my books. I want people to like, you know, offer me this kind of feedback. Like I, I I've never, you know, I don't really care about like. You know, if I, I have to compete on those terms simply because that's just that's the survival that that produces the ability to do mm-hmm. the things I really want to do. But generally speaking, if if I could magically just have all those needs met and I could just like do my writing, like not worry about anyone or anything, I, mm-hmm. you know, I just would I, I you know, and that's and that's kind of like, you know, uh, something to yeah also sort of worry about. I mean, because it's like, you know, you, you also don't want to be the type of person that keeps everyone at arm's length and says, you know, like, fuck you. Like you should reach out. Like I do try to reach out. I, I do try to like be human. You know what I mean? But um, mm-hmm. I, I definitely have that inclination. And I, I think if more people had that inclination, things would be better. If they were more yeah. like me, if people were more like me, right. They're the classic refrain. You could, yeah, everyone was just, like me. Got, you got to have a big bit of an amphibian. Don't you, you have to kind of like, because you know, you, uh, um, um, you got to be the type of person who obsessively fixates on something yeah. kind of where you pursue it and like but you also have to be interested engaged enough in kind of other things and difference exactly. for its own sake yeah. to be able to draw things together interestingly to, to create sort of interesting things i mean we were saying um earlier you know we touched on ideas about art and kitchen this episode and you know i you know um some object to the term kitsch but i just think the thing that makes art art in a high sense is that kind of there's you know like that moment of from the red shoes you know i, I you do it because you kind of have to you know no one's asking you to do this sort of stuff no one asked vonnegut to make this book well maybe they did i don't fucking know what his publishers were like but no one no one was asking jackson pollock to do splats no one was uh, and in a way it's kind of yeah it's um you know you you really you're you're drawn and i think art sort of that kind of high art there uh, is sort of a, a thing about pure daring and it, it's what connects vonnegut maybe even to the abexes but also to Cezanne and you know other figures we could mention mm. kind of like um, uh, that you know, no one asked them to do this you know to, not not really this and so so uh in a way um Ha, uh it's some uh it kind of it kind of it, it kind of can't help but but um but kind of uh but but in you know, because we talked about the real too like um uh, it can't help but feel like sort of vitally connected to kind of something that's kind of in a, in us innately as human beings kind of like that sort of that sort of need to sort of um um to sort of um experience variety sort of sensuosity to sort of to live life and in the Nietzschean way to not waste it 
So mm. yeah, is is that a profound enough quote to to um uh, to um uh, end our um uh, extended meandering conversation? We had many many profound quotes. <laughs> this was this was a very uh very good. I I said in the notes like, oh yeah, this is going to be like you know. I, I don't have much to say. It's going to be a shorter show. It turns out to be like almost four <laughs> fucking hours long um, on one Jesus. on one novel. And it's not even that long of a novel, right? Um, but all right, it is what it is, guys. Thank you for watching Artifact number 24. Uh, this is also available as an audio podcast wherever you get your podcast. Just, just check the description in the video. If you are listening to the audio podcast you could check out check us out on youtube auto machination is the youtube channel that will also be found as a link um thank you guys for watching i'll be coming back with something soon even a week after the show so we have a bunch of stuff coming soon thank you everyone and we'll be back later Oh my god. Oh my god.